You are watching Co-op for Two, broadcasting live from Champaign, Illinois, around 11.30 p.m. Saturday, February 6th, 2021. I'm Jesse Reichler. Greg has the night off. And today we are continuing our series of these detective games, and we're going to play Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, um, the Baker Street Irregulars box. The first case, which is called the Curzon kidnapping. So it's kind of exciting to see the comparisons between these different games. And Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective was sort of the, the start of this whole thing. So let me just quickly take a little diversion, look at the chat, make sure that we're broadcasting. People can see, I guess we can. I'm not sure how many people are going to have to join us for this video, but it's good to see everything seems to be working. Okay, so Sherlock Holmes, Consulting Detective, was one of the, maybe the original, there were probably some smaller, uh, similar games, but it was the big game that pioneered this format of sort of a detective mystery with paragraphs that you could read when you went to certain places. And Sherlock Holmes, uh, Consulting Detective came out in maybe 81, 1981, 1980, somewhere around there. I think it was French in origin. And then it came out with some expansions that were released in different channels um, and then got revitalized uh, with this whole new board game wave. Um, and then in the 80s got a huge, uh, sorry, in the 2000, somewhere in the 2000, maybe 2010, 2008, got reprinted by Astari. Um, and then they've made several other big box editions with, with more cases. But in addition to that, in addition to the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective expansions that continue to this day, we're playing one that's very recent, there were spin-offs from that. Um, we played one uh, last week we played Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine game, which was a spin-off, but there was also Gumshoe, which is an 86 game that's fascinating to us. We can't wait to play that out of print. And then Mythos Tales. Um, so if we look over here, there's Ellery Queen we played. There's Gumshoe. Here's the original Sherlock Holmes, not the original original, but the, the reprint. And then here's two big box expansions that came out, Carlton House in Queens Park and Jack the Ripper. Sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction there. Jack the Ripper here, which Greg and I have talked about before, was a, I thought was an amazing artistic experiment, but terribly frustrating. Uh, mystery and then Mythos Tales, with the, which was the Cthulhu reimagining using the same system. But each time they they come up with little tweaks, and this one has a tiny little tweak to the system that we're going to look at. So let's talk about this box. We'll open this one up so you can see the basic um, what the basic thing looks like, and these are all the Sherlock Holmes or at least the new versions are quite similar. They're the best produced of all of these games and you'll see it's quite beautiful. Um, I think the map here, if we look at this map of London, is actually reused in all the big box Sherlock Holmes games. It's not exactly the same map. This one's actually a little less readable, but I believe that the locations are all the same. There may be one or two additions. There's a better map in one of the other boxes, but I'm afraid they might have added a location. So I'm gonna, we're going to use this one. So let's let's take a look. Let's open it up. Here's the um, here's the back of the box, and I'll tell you a little bit about how this particular box came about. But first, let's look at what's in it. Um, so we've got rules. Okay, which we'll talk about. We've got this is sort of. I don't know if this was the first game that introduced that, but all of the Sherlock, all of the others, because it's such a wonderful idea, all the others have copied this idea. So there's newspapers, typically from the day of the case. And one of the ideas is that 
when you get up to the later cases, there may be clues in previous newspapers. So there's a whole bunch of newspapers. Here are our one for this case over here. We'll look at that in a second. So the uh, newspapers are for flavor, but also some little clues hidden. And then one of the things that the new reprints of the Sherlock Holmes have decided to do was they put each case in its own little booklet. So 10 cases per box traditionally. We're gonna play the first one. And um, beautifully illustrated with some little, in addition to the paragraphs with clues. And then the new thing that the uh, Space Cowboys reprints have done is they've got the solution and then they've got a little, uh, I guess the, how you score, how you score, how well you did. One of them is how Sherlock Holmes, how Sherlock Holmes figured it out. We'll get to that in a second. Okay, so that's the box. We don't need that anymore. We can put this back on the shelf. And come back. Um, if you remember Ellery Queen, very similar system. We've also got this directory of London, which has an alphabetical listing of all the people who are in London of import. And then in addition to the alphabetical listing, we've got lists by category. So these are, you can see government offices, banks, churches. They, lift, they give you their location on the London map. Um, if you remember Ellery Queen, actually one of the rare cases where Ellery Queen was so historically fascinating for us for New York City was that that directory, actually, they put a huge amount of work into telling you all about the different neighborhoods, some historical stuff, and they actually had listings of the index in different ways. It's actually the Ellery Queen uh, directory was, would have been nice to see uh, something like that for London. So then we've got our map, which we'll look at in a second. We've got a little um, reference sheet for sort of consultants, informants, consultants, and where they live. And this is a nice thing that we were missing a little bit from our Ellery Queen playthrough, which is that these people, looks like about 10 of them, are available in every case, right? So most cases will only have certain locations that are of interest. These people are, it's almost like a little hint system, but you kind of have to go here. So it's not an optional thing, but you can actually talk to um, Sherlock Holmes himself. So we can go visit him at 42 Northwest is somewhere in here. I haven't played this in a while. So here he is over here. Um, and you can talk to the newspaper people and, um, you know, the, the person who's got their ear to the criminal underworld. So we're going to probably be going to most of these places for every case. Um, let's look at our, our map here. We've got Northwest, uh, uh, central, east, central, southwest, southeast. There's a little scale here at the bottom, which you occasionally will use. Um, it tells you how long it would take someone to travel. So 15 minutes for about two inches. Um, and, I, and that's by foot, I believe. Uh, so if someone says, you know, they were here at 8 p.m. and it took them three hours to get two blocks away, then you know that's a little suspicious, or you might want to see if the crime was committed here. Then you look around um, where they might be, and some of these places are labeled. We've got a prison, Victoria Station, etc. So we'll, we'll be consulting this map, and the, the story and the clues will tell us where things happen, just like the other games. Here's an example of the newspaper. This is today's newspaper for this case, which you can see, uh, November 19th, uh, 1885, and November 19th, 1885. So this is our case. Uh, most of this will be just for flavor, but there may be some clues. So you know if you're watching this video and these videos, they're not the most um, you know, you're going to be doing a lot of watching of me with my head down reading, but this channel is about keeping you company. You could 
doze off to sleep and just have it in the background. So we'll try not to speak too loudly and share the experience with you. I'm interested in playing these games, not just for the fun of playing these games, but Greg and I are gonna do a review of all these detective games, which we tend to like the old ones and the modern ones and compare them. So this is part of going back to the Sherlock Holmes games. Before we get started, let's talk a little bit about this box. So I don't remember who the original designers of Sherlock Holmes were. I think they were French. I'm not positive in the 80s. This box is by Dave Neal. I believe it's Dave Neal. Yeah, Dave Neal, who has designed one other game, I, sin I think, since, since then. But, but he was a fan. He loved the original, and he started making some additional cases. Loved the original, made some additional cases on his own, and... Um, submitted them and you can he's got a little diary of of when this happened it was like 2013 2014 and they decided hey we like them so much let's make a whole box of them and he worked on them for a few years and this was very recent this is like 2020 so this is the most recent stuff made for Sherlock Holmes consulting detective and I am excited to see it now I'm a little wary because the one thing that the that that uh, made me fall in love with the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective games was the atmosphere of being back in time to the 1800s. For me, that is a wonderful sort of uh, it's a wonderful experience, and it's hard to find that kind of thing in a board game. For me, that that overshadows even the mystery deduction part of this. So. I'm sort of in it for the atmosphere. And that it was fun because when we played Elroy Queen, we were sort of in it for the atmosphere of the 1980s Manhattan. And now we're in it for the 1880s London. So we're going to keep that in mind. It would be nice to also get a nice mystery out of this, a nice story, but I'm in here for the flavor. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic to see how Dave Neal brings us the atmosphere of the 1800s. I'm a little nervous because it's hard to pull off, but we're gonna see, we're gonna see how it goes. So let's see, we've been on air 26 minutes or so. Uh, chat channel seems like it's coming through okay. Shall we, I guess we're not gonna take a break. We're just gonna, we're just gonna have a sip of tea and get right into it and read the introduction to the case. Uh, yeah, we should say, I mean, Sherlock Holmes' uh, Arthur Conan Doyle published in the 1880s, I believe. So, this box called the Baker Street Irregulars, um, the Baker Street Irregulars were like street kids that Sherlock Holmes and Watson would use to to go discover stuff, like they would give them missions and stuff. So we're playing the kids in this game, which is, you know, I'd rather play the person who investigates the serial killer, but these kids were, this is 1800s, these kids were pretty rough. They had jobs and, I mean, these kids didn't have jobs, but a, a kid's life in the 1880s was, was different and they had to grow up fast. Um, so I don't know how well you can see this top-down map. I mean, obviously you can't read the numbers. It's not that important. We'll mark, we'll mark things with our metal cubes here to remember, and we're going to keep good track. So I guess I'll, I'll tell you about the new thing that this game has added as we read. It should happen. Um, okay, let's, here we go. Case one. Thursday, November 19th, 1885, the Curzon Street Kidnapping. Through the early 1880s, the Baker Street Irregulars were occasionally summoned by the consulting detective Sherlock Holmes to help him track down a subject or obtain the kinds of knowledge about London's dark underbelly that inconspicuous and agile street children are particularly adept at acquiring. But it was not until November's day in 1885 that the Irregulars had their first chance to demonstrate the true extent of their deductive skills. 
At that point, they began to progress from being occasional helpers of the great detective to becoming his steadfast colleagues. On a clear and icy November morning, we have been summoned to Baker Street by a note from Holmes. The note says, Come quickly, client expected. Obtain particulars of case. May be late, Holmes. Dr. Watson admits us. Apparently, Holmes has been at Baker Street very little during the last few days, he says, as Mrs. Hudson pours hot tea for us all to stave off the winter cold. I received a note similar to yours. I wonder what he's up to, remarks Wiggins. That's us, Wiggins is... Wiggins is the leader of the Baker Street Irregulars, I believe. Shortly after, Mrs. Hudson shows a tall, dark-haired woman of middle age into the, into the room. She has a kind face that suggests an underlying calmness, but that bears the anxious demeanor of someone who has endured recent turmoil. She scans the room, presumably wondering which of us is the detective. All right, we got a long, long introduction here. My name is Dr. Watson. The doctor moves forward and pours tea for our guest to try to alleviate the awkwardness of the situation. Mr. Holmes is running late, but sends his apologies. In the meantime, if you would care to tell us what it is that brings you here, so we are all his trusted associates. She takes a breath and smiles. It is clear she feels she has come to a safe place. Very well, Dr. Watson. You may have read something of me in the newspapers. My name is Wendy Sturton, and a few days ago, I was kidnapped. She takes a breath and smiles. It's clear she feels... Oh, we already did it. Ah, says Wiggins, your governess to the train family. Yes, she replies. I have been governess to them for just over a year. I look after their children, Duncan and Clarence, and take care of the household matters. I took up the position when I moved to London from Derbyshire, where I was governess for Lord and Lady Snowed. The trains have been good to me, and I adored the children. Everything seemed wonderful until recently. But I digress, and must return to the point of my visit. On the afternoon of 16th November, I was on an errand to obtain some more laudanum from the chemist. Laudanum. I don't know what that is. As little Duncan was ill with a cough. It's probably like some codeine, <laughs> some heroin for the kid. As little Duncan was ill with a cough. I thought we had some in the house, but when I checked, the bottle was empty. I was turning off Curzon Street onto Half Moon Street when I heard a carriage come close beside me. Suddenly, there was an arm around me and something over my mouth so I could not scream. I was pushed into the carriage and then something over my head so I could not see. We can see that recounting the events is of some difficulty for her, but she retains her composure remarkably well. I was lifted up and placed on a seat and a voice whispered to me, sorry if that was a little rough. It'll be easier now. I remember the phrasing because it felt strange. You understand, in that context. I do not know how long I was in the carriage. It seemed an age, but I could hear busy sounds of the city for most of that time. And then I remember it grew quieter. I was led out of the carriage into a building, then tied to a chair. I could hear whispering while this was happening, and I'm sure there were two people in that room. Two people with me in that room. There I stayed overnight. I could not sleep, and at times there were movements and sounds that indicated to me there was someone else in the room. A fire was kept burning, and occasionally I would smell tobacco, though I am not a smoker myself. So when I asked, I could not give the police any indication of the brand being consumed. I asked why I was being kept and what they wanted. After I had asked perhaps 20 times, my captor became sick of my questioning, and finally I received an answer. We're just waiting for a payment, miss. 
Then you can go. Be patient. Well, Dr. Watson, it is hard to be patient when one is tied to a chair and held captive in some unknown place, but I told myself there was nothing I could do, and so I waited. And one time a soft voice spoke to me and asked if I was in need of anything. I think it may have been a woman's voice, but I cannot be sure. I asked for water and was duly given some. Eventually, on what I took to be the next day, I heard movement and whisperings. Then a man said loudly, they're not going to pay, let's release her. I was taken back into the carriage. The sounds of the city quickly returned and shortly thereafter, I was told to step onto the street. I did so and it was a few moments before I realized my captors had gone. Some people found me and unbound my hands and removed my blindfold. I was in a small alley near Stratton Street, not far from the spot where I was taken. The police interviewed me and I told them everything I have told you. That, I hoped, was the end of it. And the police certainly thought as much. But the problem is, Dr. Watson, the police have not caught the kidnappers and I fear they have ceased their search. I've tried to move on from this incident, but I cannot. I have always thought of myself as an independent woman. I grew up near Buxton in Derbyshire and I would spend my mornings walking over the majestic hills of that country, county. Now I get what I can from the London parks, but at this time of year, they are not frequented in the early morning, which is when I have my leisure time. I know the policemen who work in the parks, which gives me a degree of security, but in some of the areas I walk, I hardly ever see another soul. I tried to go for a walk yesterday, but for the first time in my life, the isolation made me afraid. What if the kidnappers come back for me again? I need to know that I am safe. Miss Sturgeon, says Wiggins, before you began this narrative, you suggested that something had changed for the worse in the train household. Could you tell us what that was? I do not see that it can have anything to do with my kidnapping, but the atmosphere in the house has changed. Mrs. Train had been kind to me, a welcoming and peaceful soul since I began working for her, but this summer she became more distant and occasionally overcome with bouts of melancholy. Around the same time, Duncan's cough came back, and Dr. Richards thought it could be an infection. Mrs. Train loves her children dearly, and each time Duncan is ill, she takes care of him. I wonder if that has contributed to her sadness. Thank you, Mrs. Sturton, says Wiggins. Oh, Wiggins is us. There, we're the kid. It may mean nothing, but as Holmes says, any slight detail can be important. Speaking of Holmes, where is he, says Tinker. It's another one of their regulars, I think. I don't know, answers Watson, but perhaps we should begin the investigation ourselves. I'm sure you have all learned something of Holmes' method over the years. You have worked for him. What do you say, Wiggins? Are you and your irregulars ready to tackle a mystery? Wiggins looks to us, and we all nod, eager to get started. Good, says Watson. Then, as Holmes would say, the game is afoot. I like that little illustration of something. All right, so there's our mystery. We've read the start. Now notice this one. Notice this one's not holding our hand. There's no list of clues and locations. That's interesting. We're going to have to look back at this and make some marks. She's got some interesting tale about being picked up in the city, and then it gets quieter, so we know they probably took her out of the city. Let's see what people in the chat have to say. Um, hey, someone, we've got someone who's not already a close friend of mine has, uh, has dropped in, <laughs> is asking about Lord of the Rings. Okay, uh, that's Greg, yeah, Lord of the Rings is gonna be Greg. I think they're gonna reprint everything, but um, you can get, if you go on Board Game Geek, <laughs> It's like a five hour video and we're gonna talk about Lord of the Rings. If you go on uh if you go on Board Game Geek for that Lord of the Rings cycle, you know, Board Game Geek has a way to purchase used games from people, which is a great way to buy games or trade. But I would go there and go on eBay if you want to buy it used. 
Okay, so let's go back through this. One of the painful things about watching me play this solo, which is why it's so much better with Greg, is that, um, you know, I'm reading it. I'm only half paying attention to it. I've got to reread it. With two of us, it's a little easier to remember. But let's um, let's look at this, and then I'm gonna we're gonna put some clues on the board. Then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about since we haven't played Sherlock Holmes, we played Elderly Queen. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the differences and the the rules of the game and the action mechanic. But let's let's start here and, and look at this. Okay, so she's come in to us. Well, I guess we're gonna have to make notes too. So Wendy Sturton just. Sit back and relax. This is gonna, you know, this game's gonna take us a while. Wendy Sturton is the governess. She was kidnapped. Okay. Um, and it is she's coming to us on November nineteenth, right? That's when we're starting our case. And then we've got the train family, that's she works for, right? She works for the train family. And Duncan is the kid with being treated with heroin. Someone can look up in the chat what that uh, what that medicine actually was. Um, Duncan and Clarence are the kids. I guess we don't really need to know about Clarence, but Duncan is the one who's sick. And um, this is the trip. So. Maybe we need a separate place for clues. Here's some of our clues, right? Like Mrs. Train has been mean lately, right? Another clue is she uh, she was taken out of the city. Okay. She's from Derbyshire. She's very proud of that. She mentioned that a few times. She was on an errand to go to the chemist, right? So there's an, there's another, she was going to the chemist from the train's house. So already I'm liking that this one is not, normally uh, in these things you'd be given like, here's your starting clue, go talk to this person. We're already having to figure out, like, we're going to find the chemist that's near her house. That might that might be where, check in on her. Okay, so the kidnapping, kidnapping is on November 16th, three days ago. Um, okay, so she checks. So here's another clue, right? Uh, the bottle was empty in the house and she thought there was should be more and it was laudanum let's see uh laudanum yeah l-a-u-d-a-n-u-m and uh, in this game you're not supposed to be looking stuff up but you guys could look it up and you know please i hope you guys help me solve this case without greg i could use the help so actually she says where she was she says she was turning off Curzon, hence the name of this mystery, Curzon Street Kidnapping, onto Half Moon. That's where the kidnapping occurs. So she actually never made it, it sounds like, to the... She was on an errand. She doesn't say whether she's coming back or, or, or going there kidnapping, but she's kind of implying that it was when she was on her way. Okay, so she was kidnapped um, at that location. Let's find that location. So Curzon and Half Moon. Well, this is going to be hard to find stuff on the map, but let's, um, let's try it this way. If we get our directory out here. So there isn't a lookup by street, but what we might do is let's look up the trains. They're a famous family, so they're going to be in this directory here. 
uh, train Kenneth and Sally. These are different people. Is is um. Let's see. I guess I'm gonna read through this and see if we can get which of the trains this is. But um, I guess before I do that, uh, let's go through here and, and look at more, find more clues, and then we can move on. So there were another clue is there were two people kidnapping her, right? Two people, two kidnappers, probably one a woman. It sounded like she thought. Um, and then there was tobacco. One of the kidnappers smoked tobacco. Um, and they say, they give the reason for the kidnapping that they're going to get money, right? She says, we're waiting for payment. Kidnappers waiting for payment. Now, they don't say that they're ransoming her. They might be paid to do the kidnapping, um, but otherwise we would assume that it's a ransom, like they kidnapped her ransom, but you would think you'd kidnap the kids if you wanted to ransom, not the governess. So it's possible that instead of a ransom, they ordered her to be kidnapped, I'm not sure. Um, okay, uh, and we know taken out of city, okay. Um, they dropped her off. So they dropped her off near Stratton, not far from where she was taken. Well, that seems pretty. I'm not sure why they would do that, but why wouldn't they? Um, okay, and then she talks about how she's having a hard time walking around. She doesn't feel safe. That's why she's hired us. Okay, and and Dr. Richards is their doctor, is the train family doctor. Train doctor. So he might know a little bit more about the kid's cough. Um, and she started getting mean. Where's our note? Mean when kid was sick. So the kid starts getting sick. The mother gets mean. That's not that. That's not that out of the question. Unless it's one of these Munchausen by proxy thing where the mother is. You really jump to these conclusions in these games. But maybe she becomes more distant, overcome with. So she's not really being mean. She's sort of being depressed maybe you would say, rather than mean. Um, but she takes care of the kids. Okay. I wonder if that has contributed to her sadness. Okay. Two people in the room. I don't see any other clues. Uh, you guys can let me know if you picked up any clues in here. She's middle-aged and calm. All right. So let's see if we can't find some locations to look at. What we'd like to do is find the uh, on the map Curzon and Half Moon. Um, if someone knows where that is. We know she was going to the chemist, but boy, it would be nice to to look. I actually, by some coincidence, see Curzon Street here. Without my glasses, that's going to be exceedingly unlikely. But here's Curzon Street here, and here's Half Moon. Okay, so there's the location where she was picked up. And then she says she was dropped off at Stratton Street. 
which I can see is this street right here. And I guess I could zoom in a little bit, but it's probably not going to make much of a difference. So she was, she was dropped off. I'm just going to, I'm not going to put a separate marker there because it's so close. Curzon and Stratton. Okay. Now she was picked up, taken out of the city. Does she say how long the carriage ride was? She says, um, carriage came, something over her mouth, pushed into the carrot. Uh, so there was another clue, right? Um, the voice whispered to me, sorry if that was a little rough. It'll be easier now. I remember the phrasing because it felt strange, you understand, in that context. So the kidnapper, another clue is the kidnappers were kind, right? It seemed an age, but I could hear the busy streets of the city for most of the time. Then I remember it grew quieter. I was led out of the carriage into a building and tied to a chair. So we don't know how long she was in that carriage. It could have been, she says it seemed like an age. This will be a, it would be nice to like press her a little bit on how, how long it took. She seems so calm. She might know. Um, I can see in the, in the chat, they are having, <laughs> they're talking about totally other stuff. Pandemic legacy. Guys, I need your help with this case. Uh, can we get a little bit of focus on the case? Maybe you're just waiting. Okay. It's okay. You don't have to focus on the case. I'll just, the whole theory of this channel is to reproduce the experience of being in the room or the board game store with the with your friends who are playing another game at another table. So really, you're not supposed to have to help me with this case. You're just supposed to listen in the background and while you work or do something, have this chatter in the background. So okay, you guys go about your you you have your you have your you have your chat about whatever you want. All right, so let's look at our map here. If it was a short trip, it would be right to Hyde's Park, but that doesn't make, that doesn't, that's, Hyde, first of all, she, she said they were taken to a building. So no one has a building in Hyde's Park, right? I don't think. It seems, I mean, maybe, I don't know what buildings are here. Uh, they could have taken her off the map for all we know. But she says most of the journey, she could hear the city, right? So if you look at this map here, it's not going to be Hyde's Park. First of all, it's too close. And then, you know, it's like three blocks. That doesn't seem an age. So most of the travel has to be in the city, the sounds of the city. Let's take a better look at this map here. So most of the time in the city and then outside the city, I mean, these are, this is all London. So it's not really, we're not, we don't really have the map of the outside London. So London is all going to be quite busy. So it may be that they took her someplace and then went off the map. But we don't know what route they would have taken. So that doesn't seem like we know that much about at this point where they went. Maybe a witness at the scene will have seen something. All right. I'd like to um, go talk to the trains and see that kid. Um, maybe we should be making a note here of things we want to do. So we'd like to talk to the trains, trains family, right? We'd like to find their house, go talk to them. Another thing I'd like to do, if we're looking for witnesses, we might visit the buildings around here, especially the chemist. 
visit the chemist. Chemist might have some information. Maybe they'll be like, well, this was just refilled last week. So it shouldn't be out, shouldn't be empty. Then we have this sort of a drug. They might tell us a little bit about that drug as well. Um, we might, um, so another thing we might be is visit nearby kidnapping. Since the kidnapping and the return were both in the same place, if we talk to the stores around there, they may have seen something. You've seen the carriage. And then, of course, we've got uh, all of these people to talk to. And then we've got our newspaper, which I think maybe we'll read the newspaper now so we know what to keep our ears open for. Um, and maybe this is a good time to take a little five minute break. And while everyone uh, cogitates on the the, the mystery so far and decides if there's some clues I missed where you want to go what you want to look up next so we will take a five minute break and we'll be back
Okay, we are back. So you might have noticed there was a little bit of confusion with the countdown timer there. Hopefully anyone who wanted to be back. So I took a little break uh, and got an email about someone stuck in the elevator. It's past, half past midnight. I had to go rescue someone from the elevator. Okay, but we're back on our case. Um, so the other thing that she said was that I was just looking quickly over this before we looked at it. She worked, she's been working for them for a year. She was with Snowed, the Snowed family before then, but a year, that's too long for there to be any issue with her and the previous people she worked for. Okay. So. I do want to find, if we look in the chat, we see if any suggestions. There's there's someone about uh, saying something about the chemist. We're definitely going to find the chemist she was going to just because it's the one, one of the few leads we have. I want to talk to the train family. I want to find the chemist uh, nearby places, which is similar to the chemist. And then we've got our places here. So let's go to the newspaper. And before we actually get started on this case, we're going to read a little bit about the newspaper and see if there is anything of import in today's newspaper. So I'm not going to read this whole thing to you. I'm going to sort of skim it. There's a birth in Liverpool, marriage, doesn't look... It's hard to know what's going to be relevant for you guys. I'm just going to read it. Okay, so here we go. On the 26th of October, Miss Sally Train, 67 years of age, at her home in St. George Square. So in the death notice, we got an obituary here. Um, in uh, On October... So is that going to be the, is that going to be like the grandmother of the kids? So October 26th, this is from the newspaper. October 26th, Sally Train, age 67, dead. Home in St. George Square. Okay. Well, let's 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 find this one. Now we pinpoint where the family lives. We now we know what train family it is, unless unless they're living differently. So Sally trained at Sally Train lived at seventy five Southwest, which should be St George Square. So there's our Southwest. Less than 75. 75 Southwest. So. There's 75. Okay. Interesting. Near the outskirts of London. That's. Is that where she, this one woman was working? That's pretty far. That's a long walk. Maybe it's a different, maybe that's the matriarch of the family and the rest of the family lives differently. Where's the other train? There's another train family house here. There's Kenneth Train, who's at 61 Northwest. 61 Northwest is much closer. That's interesting. So that's quite interesting, right? Like, this is probably where she works. And then some other relative of the trains, we don't know the relation, died all the way down here on October 6th. Now, that's five weeks from today, or six weeks from, from, to, from today. And remember what she said. She said that... 
Um, this summer she became more distant. Oh, I see. Around the time. Okay, so actually she started getting sick and depressed earlier. Okay, but we definitely want to see what happened with this Sally train. What's her... What's the relation to this for this dead woman? Probably not a coincidence on why she's dead. Okay. Let's see what else we got. On the 14th, suddenly at home in Palace Street, Colonel Vincent Keeley in its 52nd year. I don't think that it doesn't sound relevant. If we completely ran out of clues, we could check that. Here's some personals. So again, remember what we said in the beginning about how the thematic part of this game of putting us back in 1800 is so wonderful. So here we've got, um, so maybe we will read this. Uh, so we've got some marriages and some births. Here's some personals. E.C. Quigley, your coat and briefcase are at the Wisteria Lounge. Please collect at your nearest convenience. If we think E.C. Quigley is involved, we could go check out his coat and uh, briefcase. L.J.P., I seek your assistance at the nearest opportunity, Metropolitan Hotel Friday, Arthur. Okay. Mr. T. Parker of the Ancient Society of Angron announces his arrival in London. <laughs> okay, miscellaneous. Amber and Company, high quality cigars and cigarettes for the discerning smoker imported from colonies worldwide. So here's some advertisement type thing. So if we, I mean, we have no, we have nothing to ask them about with the tobacco, but if we get more tobacco weeds, we could go to the tobacconist and see if they know. Uh, wanted furniture of all kinds and conditions, fair price paid. Uh, these, are, these all have locations associated with them, 45 EC. Uh, Waldenbach Forest, purveyors of fresh, high-quality plants, flowers, and botanical items, 24 Old Bond Street, Northwest. To be sold at the price of 4,000 guineas, a bright house, number 74, Bloomsbury Way, with gardens, early English mantles and stoves, and all modern improvements. Four bed and dressing rooms, bathroom, double drawing room. How'd you like a double drawing room? Library and lounge. That sounds like a nice house in London. 4,000 guineas. I'll take it. Apply to Mrs. Joan Pitch and Company at 42 Southeast. Okay. Entertainments. Faust. Chapel and Company have boxes and stalls in the best situation at the Elephant and Castle for Grunod's celebrated opera featuring Miss Dunstan and Miss Isla Neal. 50 Bond Street. Miss Eliza Delane of Rochester, New York is currently visiting London and will be giving recitals at various operatic works from Thursday 19th to Sunday 22nd. Here's a little blurb about the trial of the Notting Hill murder. Let's see. Let's do a little experiment. I'll see if we can zoom you in here. Not, not really helpful, is it? Trial of the Notting Hill Murderer. On Wednesday, the trial of Carl Selden, Carl Selden, the notorious Notting Hill murderer, came to a close with Judge Blake presiding. With respect to the ferocity and brutality of the murders committed, Miss, Mr. Lane, arguing for the defense, pushed for a communication commutation of the death sentence on grounds of insanity. Mr. Harrow Shaw, for the prosecution argued against such a position, stating that the atrocity of the crimes forwent any sentence but the just loss of life for the prisoner. After deliberation, Judge Blake ruled in favor of the, def the defense. Selden is to be interred for life in Princeton Prison, Dartmoor. Suicide in Hyde Park. On Wednesday, that's interesting. This is the... Wednesday would be yesterday from the paper, yesterday from today, but after the kidnapping. On Wednesday, near Stanhope Gate, reports were made that on a seat a little distance away, a man was bleeding from the throat. 
having caused the injury himself by means of a blade. On arrival at the spot, police could see nothing of the man, but found a trail of blood on a path leading to the serpentine. Being unable to attain a further trace of him, they went to the Royal Humane Society receiving house for the purpose of informing the officials in order for a search to be made by boat. Upon arriving there, it appeared it Information had already been given for the dead body of a man had just been taken out of the water. Um, so that's interesting. Is that related to our case? First of all, who commits suicide by cutting their throat and then running to the water? Like, how do we know that's a suicide? All right, let's, let's find Hyde Park and see where that is. That might be related to our case. I guess we've got to zoom out again. I'm sorry, guys. We don't have a better way to do this. I hope it's focusing. Let me know in the comments if it's not focusing. So Hyde Park, huh? Let's see what we've got here. St. James, Green, Hyde Park. Uh-huh. Near our case. The plot thickens. All right. So there was a suicide, a man dead in Hyde Park. They, cops think by suicide, right? I guess I'll put this. So we, when we go to a place, we'll, mark, we'll put it with green. So bleeding from the throat at near Stanhope Gate. Reports were made. Where's Stanhope Gate? Did I just make up Hyde Park? What, it says near Stanhope Gate. A seat a little distance away, I was bleeding from the throat, having caused the injury himself by means of a blade. We don't know if it was really by himself. Leading to the Serpentine. Where is the Serpentine? That's going to be a river, maybe? Being unable to obtain any further trace, they went to the Royal Humane Society receiving house. So Royal Society Receiving House, which I don't know what that is, the Royal Society Receiving House, to inform the officials to search by boat because it's leading to the Serpentine River or whatever Serpentine is. Upon arriving there, it appeared the... Uh, Information already been given for the dead body of a man had been taken out of the water. Where did I get Hyde Park? Oh, here we go. Suicides in Hyde Park, unfortunately, have become a rampant, a frequent occurrence. Though, though drowning in the serpentine is usually the method adopted, the revolver and poison are sometimes resorted to, and even hanging in the trees, as was the case last April when the body of a man was discovered in broad daylight, suspended by a piece of cord from the bow of a tree situated between the Marble Arch Gate and Police Station. So let's take a look at Hyde Park a little more closely for a second here. Um, so I guess if you knew London better, you might know where this serpentine river is but i'm guessing that it's out that it's out here but it would be nice to know where the royal society receiving house was shall we look that up before we continue here let's make sure we don't knock things around let's look here and see what we've got if we've got alphabetical. So I'm looking up Royal Society Receiving House. It's not in the alphabetical. It's a lot of royal places, but not there. Let's take a quick look through here and see. Was it a gov? I mean, I don't even know what that is, a Royal Society Receiving House. 
unless it's a government office. It would be someplace nearby, surely. Settlement houses, solicitors. What do you think the Royal Society Receiving House? Does someone want to look that up? Here's chemists, hotels, inns, hospitals. It's not under government offices. What's a receiving house? Is a receiving house you think? Receiving information? I mean, it's probably not even relevant to us. But it's troubling that we can't, that we, that it mentioned it. Maybe someone in the chat can figure it out or we'll just put it here. So, unable to obtain any further trace, they went to the Royal Humane Society Receiving House. Royal Humane Society. Let me look up again in the alphabetical. Royal, no, no Royal Humane Society. Under H. No, no H. I'm going to look up these locations again, just the category places, just so we know from future stuff what kinds of things are available to us. Booksellers, charities. No, it's not in charity. Chemist, department, docs. No, not in docs. Doctors. Government office, hospitals, hotels. We should say that in all of these games, all of the Sherlock Holmes games and all of the spin-offs, there are errata, inevitably mistakes, inevitably, even years of reprints mistakes get in and like mythos tales which is one of the ones we were going to we were thinking of playing tonight is just like riddled with them this one is new enough that they don't exist yet so you always got to keep in the back of your mind possible the possibility that there are mistakes but there's no reason to think that that's happened yet um okay i still don't see sports solicitors stations Synagogue, wine merchant, theaters, tea rooms, tea merchants. Um, I was thinking there might it might be like a charitable organization. There's not really there's churches. Okay, well they're not on the map, so for now. I don't see any good way to find out about where that was reported, but boy, it does seem like we might want to go there if it was if they went there and they said it's already reported. Um, okay, and then the suicide was by some area, but that may just be flavor. All right, let's keep going. Um, uh, and did we want to make Wednesday? So this was... November 18th, because today is Thursday. So November 18th was the suicide. Okay, let's go back to our newspaper. We should make, we should be careful about lo putting locations. So I've got locations on the board, but I haven't said where they were. So the kidnapping on November 16th, sorry that this is sort of scattered, but um, we're going to put this we're going to say this is near 63. 
Um, near 63. Um, and then the, uh, the Sally train was near 75, was at 75, that's her house. The suicide, we're going to say, was at 95. So I'm going to keep track of locations we want to go to. Um, and what was, okay, and then 61 was the train's house. We're going to say that's 61. I believe that's the location it was. Let's double check. Sally was at 75, and the other one's at 61 Northwest. I guess I got it right, Northwest. And this is 63 Northwest. All right, good. So we're keeping track of all of our locations on the board that we come up with. Southwest, that's good. So let's take a little, um, let me tell you a little bit about the rules of this game and how they differ a little bit from, um, from Ellery Queen and the others. And in Sherlock Holmes, normally, you'll notice, oh, well, maybe you won't notice, but it hasn't happened yet. Unlike Ellery Queen, where we were a pawn moving around, which Detective of City of Angels borrowed a little bit, in this game, in the Sherlock Holmes games, you don't have to, you don't travel to places. You don't have to spend action. So there's no, there's no worrying about you deciding I'm going to move here and then do this. You just look up where you want to look up. You are instructed to keep track of how many locations you look at and um, how many how many turns you spend and how many locations you look up and you are allowed to go back and reread locations that you've already been and then at the end of the game you're going to get some score based on how many turns it took you and how many actions um, you spent I believe they may be different based on I think the idea is when you if you look up a location and there's nothing there. Like you say, oh, let's check out 54. You look it up and it's not in the book. Then that doesn't count against you as a turn. Or it doesn't count against you as a location lookup. And if you re-look up, a, and you're allowed to go back and look at stuff. So we will keep track of what locations we visit in what order. And then you get a score. You'll, have, you'll get asked some questions. And you'll get a score based on how many of those you got right and then you'll get penalized for how long it, how many turns it took you if we don't I don't generally play that way I don't care so much about how long it took me but in general this game is very laid back about that there's isn't a deadline there's no time at which case at where this case ends we just play it until we think we understand it or get tired then we decide to look up the solution and we can calculate a score if we want. Notice, unlike Ellery Queen, there's no three-step table lookup because each case has its own booklet, which is fantastic. I mean, that's the way to go. The only risk of this one over the other one is that you'll sort of inadvertently see that there's a certain location with, a, as you're flipping through this book, you'll see, oh, 54 didn't have anything, but I accidentally saw that 52 did. But you just got to block those out. Okay, let's continue with our newspaper. You know, this the, this is supposed to be like a one hour, two hour game, but obviously it's gonna take us a lot longer. Death of an infant. Yesterday, an inquest was held at the town hall before Je George Abbey Esquire on the body of an infant named Helen Paulton. On Thursday last, the mother of the deceased sent to Mr. Taylor in Washington Street, chemist, for some infant's cordial. And Mr. Taylor gave her a pennyworth of the mixture in which laudanum, laudanum was an ingredient. A portion was given to the child which after slept very much and 
The mother, becoming alarmed, sent for Mr. Fallingham, who found it apparently dead. He, however, by great exertion, succeeded in reviving it to an extent, but after lingering for several hours, it died at 10 o'clock Friday evening. The jury, after a long and diligent inquiry, found that the deceased came to her death by incautious administration of the cordial. Which, and oh, sorry, and while they acquitted Mr. Taylor of blame, expressed a wish that he should in future be particular in directing that children are to take such cordial sparingly and to specify the quantity of cordial to be given in accordance with the age of the child to whom it was to be administered. <laughs> um, That's kind of fascinating, right? Okay, so, I mean, this is definitely possibly related, right? It's, um, so let's look at the dates here, though. Yesterday was the inquest about the an infant named Helen Paulton. On Thursday last, so a week ago, she gave... Uh, the mother goes, gives the kid a penny's worth of mixture. She gives it to the kid a week ago. The kid dies. A week later, they hold the inquest. They're like, eh, just try to do it. <laughs> They tell the chemist, well, the infant's dead, but that's all right. Next time, just give him a little better instruction on how to use this drug. <laughs> Those are different times, right? Okay, so let's make a note in this newspaper that Helen Paulton infant died from this chemical that is involved in our case, which is laudanum. Um, Helen Paulton, and let's see, the doctor Fallingham was the doctor who attended the, to the infant, um, and then Mr. Taylor is the chemist who prescribed it. He's not, he's not fault, but next time give the, <laughs> give the kid some instruction. Um, and this is Mr. Taylor in Wigmore Street, chemist. Okay, let's see in the channel. Um, oh, we've got some input from the channel. Laudanum. An alcoholic solution containing morphine. See, it was, it was, it was morphine and opium. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. So, and I oh, see someone else. Someone says it's a theater. Okay. So the Royal House was a theater. I don't know why they would be going to theater. Let me just look up the I don't, Humane Society Theater. I think I must have missed some of the comments that scrolled up. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to make these a little smaller so they don't scroll out of my view. Okay, well, that's quite interesting. I'm curious where the Wigmore chemist is. Shall we, shall we take a little break from the newspaper and put some chemists on our map here? So, chemist. Okay, so they're the Taylor chemist, 72 Northwest. Mm -hmm. It's the same chemist that our person was going to, probably. There's the chemist. So, 72 Northwest. Got lots of interesting places. Now, let's look if there's any other chemists in this area. Yeah. So, we're in Northwest. John Taylor. No, that's the only chemist in this area. I suppose she could have been going to a chemist here. Let's see, Southwest. 87 Southwest. 
Where's that? D7 Southwest. Well, I mean, possibly. Let's get another color cube for our less likely. So unlikely that she was going to this chemist. Oh, and look at this. There's a there's a river. Is it a river or is it a street? Piccadilly. No, it's a road. But still, it's a big road, so it seems unlikely. So I'm going to make a note where the chemist here. Is it chemist? I think that's probably 72 Northwest. but possibly 87 Southwest. Unlikely, but possibly. All right. Um, what else did we want to look up here? Those are our, that's our chemist. The trains, okay. Hyde Park. All right, back to the um, comments. Anything, receiving houses of theater. Hmm. Why would they tell the receiving house? It's the Humane Society. They found the body. Unable to obtain further trace, they went to the Royal Humane Society receiving house for the purposes of informing the officials. It's official. The receiving house is some official government office. All right. Well, we might want to check with the police about this dead body at some point. Death of an infant. Okay. Art gallery opening. The new Dunsworthy Art Gallery opened last night with a private concert by invitation only that was praised by all in attendance. Da, da, da. After a jovial performance by the Morton Burgess Minstrels, the stage was taken by Mrs. Eliza Delane for a recital of the Habanera from Biz, uh, Carmen's Bizet. Bizet's Carmen. Guests were even observed. By the way, there's a there's a great uh, I have a great CD of that. Okay, uh, maybe we'll uh, if this wasn't live we would edit it in, but it is live. But but check it. Out. I forget the um, I forget the singer. Okay, that's one of the few opera classical that I really like. Okay, uh, in attendance for the fiancé, Mr. Montague Harbuck, Grace Salende was also observed in the company with her brother Patrick and the Lewin twins, Miss Mary Dunsworthy, accompanied by her good friend, the artist Emmeline Manton, was an elegant and agreeable host, emphasizing that she will be continuing to hold the elaborate and exciting social events for which she is renowned. This was, you know, London. This is this is the, the, the social. This is where you establish your social bona fide, bona fides. Uh, okay. Uh, Luke's trade list of all countries. I have no idea what this is. Just published, volume twenty three, England, 1885, Price one pound. Arranged alphabetically by cities. This is just someone advertising their list of all countries. Okay. Governess released. Here we go. This is a newspaper article about a person. Scotland Yard have announced that Miss Wendy Sturton, reported kidnapped on Monday, was discovered and returned home on Tuesday afternoon, unharmed, with no ransom having been paid. Mrs. Sturton, Miss Sturton, is governess of the train family. The details of her capture and release, in particular that she was left in a city street, tied and blindfolded, have led police to suspect that the gang responsible are the same that carried out the Dunsworthy kidnapping. <coughs> so, boy, this case is full of leads. So, Again in the newspaper, police suspect Dunworthy kidnappers. 
Now, there is actually a reference to Dunworthy in this newspaper. We just read it. It was the art gallery opening. It says, the new Dunworthy art gallery opened last night with a private concert. So if we think it really is related to that kidnapping, we might want to check out the art gallery. Um, or the Dunworthy people. Miss Mary Dunworthy, accompanied by her good friend and artist, was an elegant and agreeable host. So we might want to check out the Dunworthies if they are related. Uh, or, I mean, maybe the police will tell us enough, but maybe the family has some extra information. So if we look up Dunworthy, and again, what, since there's since the only penalty for taking extra time is score, which I don't care about for flavor, we'll probably visit these people and talk to them. So Lady Rosanna Dunworthy, is this the same? This is Mary Dunsworthy. All right, well, she's maybe living with the, so 43 Southwest. Maybe we'll put on a board as being unlikely to be related, but possibly. 43 Southwest. And then do we need to look up the gallery? Dunsworth Art Gallery. Well, I looked up Dunsworth and I found that address. But where's the art gallery? Art gallery. Do we have art gallery? Theaters. I don't see any art gallery, so. Okay. Well, we can visit the family to see what they know about it, or the police might tell us. All right, let's continue through. We're almost done with the newspaper section of this video. Here's a letter to the editor. Sir, I must raise two issues which currently mar the otherwise charming spectacle of Hyde Park. The state of this area after dark is known, must be known, to all who have the misfortune to make a shortcut across it after nightfall. The reason is simple. It is not lighted. Applications have been made over and over again to the proper authorities, but although we are spending imperially 100 million per annum, there is no money forthcoming to light up Hyde Park. How can one wonder at the danger of the place? They love darkness because their deeds are evil. The very worst of characters, male and female, abound the park. The remedy, as I have said, is simple. The electric light, well-placed and well-distributed, would alter the conditions of the place half an hour after lighting up and forever. Furthermore, I maintain that it is not at all pleasing that the habit of smoking has crept into Rotten Row. The excuse is that the pr prince smokes. But because one person of an exceptional and unique position, doubtless under exceptional circumstances, smokes, that is no reason why the mass should follow the example, and it is well known that Queen Victoria herself finds the habit extremely distasteful. 
I only wish it spurred her to raise the substantial tobacco tax even higher to curb this inexorable rise in popularity. In the best of his stories, my novel, Lord Lytton makes Harley the hero jeer at English liberty, and he says, I no more dare smoke this cigar in the park at half past six when all the world is abroad than I dare pick my Lord Chancellor's pocket or hit the Archbishop of Canterbury a thump on the nose. Smoking is now common enough in the park and ought to be abated as a nuisance. Signed, I am, sir, your obedient service, Ethered Waterston. So Edward, Edward does not like smoking in the park. Foreign news. We have received the following through the Reuters agency. Serbian army invades Principality of Bulgaria. Serbian troops have massed on the Bulgarian frontier, ostensibly mobilized against Turkey. Prince Alexander of Bulgaria uh, sent a letter to King Milban of Serbia, which the letter refused to receive, and thereupon Bulgarian troops were sent to the Serbian frontier. Prince Alexander claimed that Serbian troops were on the Bulgarian soil, a claim which the Serbian monarch denied. So this is a whole thing about, there's a little foreign news. Foreign news. Um, so Serbia and uh, Bulgaria are, at, are coming to, are threatening to be at war. The Serbian army invaded with a force of nine battalions and 32 guns commanded by Major Gushev. The force advanced towards the city of Slivnitsa. Okay, last item in our newspaper. Mrs. Daimler and Maybach unveil the motor-propelled riding card in Germany. Daimler. Daimler Chrysler still, still in operation. Kenstadt, November 11th, the inventors Gottlieb Daimler and Wilhelm Maybach have demonstrated to the world their creation, the right wagon or riding car. Earlier this year, the pair created an astounding system which mixed gasoline with air, permitting its use as a fuel and assembled a large engine utilizing said system, which they baptized the Stondher or grandfather clock due to its resemblance to such an object. They have now installed a smaller version of the same engine in a wooden two-wheeled frame fitted with two outrigger wheels, the riding car. To demonstrate the vehicle's functionality, Miss, Mr. Maybach proposed to ride it for two miles, proposed to ride it for two miles along the bank of the River Neckel between Konstadt and Utenkeckum, Utenturkum. He left Karnstadt to the applause of considerable crowd of spectators and arrived at Unterturkheim as promised, having attained a speed of seven miles per hour. So we've just seen the invention of the automobile while playing this game. 1885. Okay, so there was actually a lot in that newspaper that could be relevant to our case. Let's lock down a couple more locations here that from our clues. Um, I see they're making fun of me in the chat channel about the receiving house. Um, Helen Paulton's infant died. So Mr. So going back to that newspaper article, so working our way backwards. Paulton was the baby that died. I mean, I feel like the police would be a better people to get information about these kidnappers, but I'm gonna put her address here if she's in the if she's in the directory. Okay, she's Paulton is not in the directory, but Dr. Fallingham was the one that diagnosed her. So let's look up in doctors. Sometimes in Sherlock Holmes. Um, You'll find a person who's got a shop and you can visit them at home or at their shops. If they're not at one, you find go to your home. If you go to your home, they're like he's working. So if we look at, let's see, doctors and physicians. Wow, I don't see falling here. Let's just look it up. By the way, the building that I live in, um, 
was built in 1929 in Champaign, uh, across from Westside Park. It's a five-story building. And it was, so we I've looked at some of the records. You can see when the building got built, Champaign had a little directory of, of people and where they lived, 1929. And it was filled with doctors. There was a doctor's office on the ground floor. There was like a doctor on every floor. It was rented at that point. Now it's condos. Um, okay, I don't see any falling hands, so I guess he's not relevant. Not important for our case. So I'm going to make a little note here in my records. I mean, if you play these games a lot, you probably would come up with some better system. I don't have a great system. Greg's pretty good at taking notes. So I'm putting the locations, some clues, and then the locations. And then if the person's not in the book, doesn't have a location, I'm just going to put a dash here. Um, and I'm putting a little squiggle if it's approximate. Back up. Um, Doctor Richard Richards was the train doctor. It's mentioned in our in our lead up. She says that um, she mentions the doctor. She says something like he. What does it say about Doctor Richards? Does anyone remember? It wasn't from our. I don't think it was from our newspaper. I think she said, um, this would be, I do have these erasable pens. I'm hesitant to write in the book, but maybe we should make little notes to ourselves. Um, so, she went to get some from the chemist, some laudanum. Where does she talk about the Dr. Richards? Here. So she's talking about the the mother and becoming melancholy over the last since the summer. Um, around the same time Duncan's cough came back and Dr. Richards thought it could be an infection. So he's the one, the doctor of the trains. So let's look up Richards in, in this doctor and see if we can locate him, talk to him. Dr. Richards is at 83 Southwest. So this is 83 Southwest. That's his, um, sorry, 83 WC, not Southwest. West Central. Okay, I mean, I do want to talk to him. Eighty three West Central, there's eighty four, eighty five, there's eighty three. Okay, well, that's pretty far away. Um, any other locations that we want to look up? Did we find the chemist? Yes, we found the chemists. It's 72 Northwest, we think is probably the chemist. 72 Northwest. <clears throat> well, <laughs> we have not looked up a clue yet. Two hours in, two hours in, we have not looked up a clue yet. How do you like that? That's what you're in for. That's what this channel is all about. Two hours in, have not looked up a clue. Everyone's gone. Everyone's asleep. It's just me. And the future viewers. Okay. Um, I know. <clears throat> I, 
I'd like to talk to the to the train family first. That seems like to me <clears throat> the natural thing. So before we look up the first clue, let's take a little moment here to tell you a little bit more about this box of Baker Street Irregulars. One more thing I remembered. Um, I believe what it, the way the game describes it is that the first half of the cases, it's either cases one through four or one through six, are each standalone little cases. They use their own newspaper. They don't use the mechanic of previous newspapers being relevant, I don't think. And then the last four cases, I believe, are tied together, are connected, which I love that that kind of long, the longer the better from my perspective. So I'm really curious to try these, but um, we're playing this one. And then the one other thing this game does introduce, the one other mechanic, I thought I would just wait till it happened, but I'm going to tell you now because it's relevant to us. The one mechanic this game adds is that, where is it? It's here. Okay. So let me show you this. This is our sheet of informants and people we can go talk to for help and um, information. Now, if you look at the back, it's a little chart. It looks complicated, uh, maybe from your view, but it's really not. It's basically just each case has its own little checkbox row where you can keep track of what of certain letters. And the way this new mechanic works is when you go to a clue, they might tell you something. Like, let's say you go to a clue and you um, discover some new, we discovered some new chemical, like arsenic. So it might say circle letter, letter A. And then when you go to another clue, it might say, if you've already heard about A, then read this. Otherwise, don't don't read it. So like it, it's like it's almost like the Chronicles of Crime, or thing where you when you can or Detective City of Angels where you're like, ask about this, but it's it's we have less agency. It's just that if you know about this fact from reading one clue, then when you go talk to a certain person, they'll tell you about it, or you could ask them about it. So it's sort of relevant now the order we talk about things because we might go to one clue and be and learn about something that we could ask someone else. But because time is not really an issue in this game and because you're allowed to go back and reread something, it would just be that if we went to some place and it said if you don't if you have A you can read that if we don't have it, we would just make a note like when we find A we'll go back here. Um so I'm really curious to talk to the trains and then we should decide which of these we want to go to early. So like the carriage stables, Sherlock Holmes, librarian, medical examiner, social columnist, uh, owner of a pub, criminologist, the National Archives, that would be for deaths, so they might know about the the suicide, then we've got a newspaper guy. He might know more about some of the stuff that's going on. Um, Scotland Yard we can go to. Do you guys in the chat have any preference where we go first? If not, I'll give you a couple of seconds. If not, I'm going to start at the trains and then I'm tempted to leave these until we hunt down some of our stuff that we already know about. I want to go to the chemist. I want to talk to the train, go to the chemist, dig a little deeper into this suicide. All right. The uh, chat says let's have a summary of what's happened so far. Uh, the governess comes in. She was kidnapped, held for ransom, we think. The kidnappers were nice. She was taken out of the city. We know that. She was on her way to buy this drug for the kid who has the cough. She was kidnapped. A couple days later, the kidnappers let her go because they didn't get their money. Uh, a couple extra clues are the mother, who's normally nice to our governess, the train, uh, train's family mother, 
has been melancholy for the last couple months. It started around when this, the son got sick. That's the son she went to get the, the opium for. And then we've got a bunch of clues in the newspaper. One is a suicide at Hyde Park by someone who had their throat cut. They think it's a suicide, we're not so sure, which is quite near our, all of our activity. Um, the police think the kidnapping sounds like a similar kidnapping of the Duns, Dunsbury, Dun, Dun, Dunworthy kidnapping. And another clue in the newspaper was another infant was killed, probably from the same chemist and the same drug. So we might want to follow through on, on learning about that family that was at the, the um, Taylor chemist. Um, the suicide was reported. Then they found a body in the river that the suicide zone we jumped to. But maybe if we check at the police, it will turn out not to be a suicide. And we also learned about the creation of the automobile. Then another clue was that the body, oh, okay. So now it's starting to, remember, not the body. The governess says she thought they had more of this opium stored up, but the bottle was empty. So she went to the chemist to get more. And the wife, the mother's feeling melancholy. So is the mother into the opium, using the opium? It wouldn't be surprising. It also wouldn't give you a motive for kidnapping. So one of our questions for the kidnapping is sort of why was she kidnapped, right? Why wasn't the ransom paid? Who did they try to get to pay for the ransom? That's why we're going to talk to the family and see if maybe the trained mother is like, well, they tried to ransom the governess and we said, no, we're not going to pay. And why would you ransom the governess? Odd. Okay, so I'm going to start by going to the trains family. Um, and we might want to look at one of the nice things is if you remember when we played Ellery Queen, it had this really neat feature where it was like here are the you could look up by number, like if you looked up this number around where she was kidnapped, it showed you all the things near it. This one doesn't. So this one says like 63. These are the nearby places. There's Piccadilly Hotel, but then there's another place, 64. So if we wanted to know, well, what is that at 64? Like what we could we could go visit it and see if it's in the thing. But there's no way to say there's no reverse lookup by number. So that's a shame. Like it would be nice to know if this was a bar, but we'll just have to go to it and see. Um, okay, I'm going to start without, um, since no one has any better suggestion, I'm going to start with the trains family. Let's see what the, let's see what the family have to say. And if you remember, there was the Kenneth who lived at 61 and then the mother, that was the other clue. The Sally trains died, died and she was there. So I think we're going to, just for the fun of it, if the, if the, if they're not, if this, if this one doesn't tell us about it, we're going to go visit here. All right, 61. Here we go. Our first clue. Two hours in. Exciting. How are you guys liking this? I'm curious. Um, I don't know who I'm talking to, but compared to the Ellery Queen, like, is it is it more enjoyable, enjoyable to be back in the 1800s? Okay, 61 Northwest. Here we go. 61 Northwest. So the, they're organized by sections. So we find Northwest. And I'm not going to... Why is... Some of these are upside down. Or, or maybe not. Okay. 61 Northwest. Sorry. So here's Northwest. 61. you got to be careful not to read. I'm not going to show it to you guys because I don't trust you not to read it. But I trust myself. 61 Northwest. Kenneth Train is a stocky, balding man in his early 40s. <clears throat> the police have the note we received, he says. 
It was found on the doorstep under a rock at 5 p.m. on the 16th of November and asked me to leave 2,000 pounds under the Putney Bridge at dawn. It was absurd. So we'll read this and then we'll go back and make note of any clues. You guys should be making clues. Boy, what if I get... Uh, this, my chat now are, are my good friends. They are wonderful. But they're, they're talking about other stuff. They got, they got their, their, their other stuff they're doing. I need like a, when Greg's not here, I need someone in the chat who's like serious about taking notes. They asked me to leave 2,000 pounds under the Putney Bridge at dawn. It was absurd. We called the police, but I believed it must be a prank. I could not pay such a ransom. I did not tell the police this at the time, but I contacted my Uncle Lawrence to inquire about funds he may have available. My uncle suggested he may be able to assist, though not for the entire sum. In any case, I did not receive that reply from him until after Mrs. Sturton had been returned to us. Why do you think the kidnappers targeted your family, Mr. Train? Why, indeed. I am the manager of a cotton factory, and reasonably well off, but I could not obtain that kind of money. Perhaps they knew I had a rich uncle. Was anyone seen leaving the note at the door? No. The police think it likely an anonymous street urchin was paid to leave it. Could you tell us about Miss Sturton? Miss Sturton has been a wonderful addition to our household. There is little that seems to shake her. Indeed, she is one of the most independent women I have ever met. What kind of things does she do in your household? asked Wiggins. My wife can best answer that for you, Kenneth replies. I will fetch her. A moment later, he re-enters the room with a short woman in her mid-thirties with dark rings under her eyes. Like she has not slept. Letitia Train looks worried by, by our presence and responds to our questions, but seems uncomfortable, occasionally fidgeting or scratching while she talks. <laughs> She's got her opium addiction. Uh, Wendy cares for the children and conducts other errands as necessary. Each day, she arises early, around six, and sees to the children, dressing, breakfast, and such. She takes her free time between 7 and 9 a.m. when the tutor, Mr. Edgar Newmarch, comes to deliver lessons. Wendy normally takes a long walk in the park, I believe. She, how she bears the cold, I do not know. She comes back at 9 a.m., helps to prepare the luncheon, then does an English or a Bible lesson with the children, followed by household tasks and running errands. Then comes over, then comes our evening meal, and soon after she puts the children to bed. And was that her schedule on the day she was kidnapped? Yes. Uh, in the afternoon, Duncan could not eat his lunch because he was feeling unwell. So uh, one of her errands was to get some laudanum from the chemist, which uh, is when it happened. I thought the police had dealt with this, Kenneth. They've not caught anyone, he replies. These fellows may find something new. Wiggins smiles at Letitia Train, but she simply turns and leaves the room. Wiggins smile... Uh, I don't wish to pry into personal matters, Mr. Train, says Wiggins, but Mrs. Sturton said your wife has been in low spirits. Do you know why that may be the case? I think you do wish to pry into personal matters, Mr. Wiggins, he replies, but I will make allowances because I know the goal of your inquiries is a worthy one. I will also be frank. I do not think my wife's mood is in any way related to the affair you are investigating. She was taken ill for a time, then Duncan's coughing problem began again, and, when, and then my mother died. Even excluding the kidnapping, this year has not been an easy one. So, so that is going to be his mother. She died. I'd like to see if she died of this of opium, but otherwise it doesn't seem all that related. Okay, so that was actually... Um, interesting. So the kidnappers, it sounds like, did try to ransom her to this address. What he's a little surprised that they think he's got money, which is a little interesting to us. So let's mark in our 
question area, like this is again, why ransom governess to the trains? Like they don't seem like they have that much money, although he runs a cotton factory. That's pretty good. 2,000 pounds. Um, and then he says, I contacted my uncle Lawrence. And he said he could help, but we only found two trains in the directory, Kenneth and Sally, the mother. So I don't know who this rich uncle is if he doesn't have the same last name. And if he does, he's not in the thing. So maybe not relevance to us. Um, we know that the governess is not involved. It's not like a self-kidnapping because she came to us. She would have no reason to. Um, the wife comes out, Letitia Train. That's the wife's name. And the wife mentions a couple people. She mentions the tutor. She mentions the tutor of the boy, Duncan, is Edgar Newmarch. I mean, he's in the house, right? Maybe he's overheard stuff, knows a little bit about the, um, knows a little bit about the wife and her opium addiction. Wendy normally takes a long walk in the park. <clears throat> so if you're, if, if the kidnappers are targeting the governess, you might ask like, how did they know they had to have been watching her? Um, how did they know to take her? Why did they pick her? So walking in the park, I mean, that might be Hyde Park. That might be the area she walks through. So you might expect that People living near the park are the people who noticed her. Um, but she takes walks by herself. Doesn't sound like she's taking walks with the kids in the cold. Uh, all right, I don't see um, too much else in this. Uh, let me know if in the in the comments if you saw something that I've missed here that might be useful. Oh, the doorstep, 5 p.m. I guess we should say that. 5 p.m. on the 16th was the ransom note. Right? Okay, and when was she kidnapped? She was kidnapped... Also, she was kidnapped on the morning. So she's kidnapped in the morning. Ransom note left at 5 p.m. All right, let's look at the comments and see what people are saying. All right, Zach says, I've been lost for two hours. This one's very different from Ellery Queen. The clues are open-ended. Governess has gotten out of the way for some reason other than ransom, is what Zach says. They needed her gone for a short while so something else could happen. Interesting. Uh, I don't know about that. Or I go to the trouble of leaving a ransom note. Unless the ransom note was left by the wife. Or it could be the tutor. The tutor would be the one who might know. If they did, if the Kenneth is right, that the kidnapper knew he had a rich uncle, then it would have to be someone who knew enough about the family to know there's a rich uncle. So... Edgar, our tutor, who I originally thought eh, is a long shot. Now I'm a little more suspicious of him. Like, could he be in on it? Let's see if we can look up this location of Edward Newmarch, the tutor. Newmarch Edgar is at 75 Northwest. 75 Northwest. Okay, so... Here's something that I normally am not very good at, but I'm going to try really hard this time to do better at. 
is we're going to keep track of all each clue as we as we look at it. So the first clue we went to, turn one was clue 61, which was trains, Kenneth train. Okay. This is good. That way we can go back to it if we want to. How are you guys in the comments liking the, do you want more top down view so you can see the map more? So we went and talked to Kenneth. <clears throat> this is going to um, test how, how badly you want to take a, a relaxed journey through this story or not. Because I'm, I'm inclined to go, like, I want to see the, the matriarch. I want to see about her death. So we're going to go, we're going to traipse all the way down here to 75 and visit Sally Train. And we're going to see if there's anything about her in here. Because we're playing this for the story and the atmosphere. And I wanna and I wanna see. So 75 Southwest. It looks like I don't know if you can see you can't see this, but um some of these are look like they're upside down. Maybe they're not there. Okay, 75 Southwest. So we replace this with a green. Here's our system. When we go to a place, we're going to put the green on top to remind us where we're going. And then when we get rid of it, we'll switch it. So 75 Southwest, we're making a note that that's where we're going next. 75, we're going to get a bad score because we're just traipsing all around. 75 Southwest. There is a for sale sign outside number 75, and the door is answered by a stocky man holding a clipboard and pen. Could we speak with Mrs. Train, asked Wiggins. I assume you are not an acquaintance of hers, the man replies, and you are evidently unaware that she has died. Indeed, sorry to hear that, says Wiggins, removing his cap as he does so. And who do we have the pleasure of addressing? Mark Balwick. I work for her brother, who is in charge of the sale of the house. And can we speak to her brother? Unfortunately, he keeps to himself, but you can try if you like. He lives at 62 Basil Street Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Balwick. So we've actually got, this is the dead matriarch. So notice that her brother is Kenneth's rich uncle. All right? Yes. So what we know is the rich uncle is at 62 Southwest. 62 Southwest. So that's interesting. Do we get a name for the brother? No. He just keeps to himself. So, I was just thinking if the family's in on it, like, what would they have to gain by this? I mean, we could just tell the, the governess to take off for a day. Um, okay, so 62 Basil Street Southwest. Let's add that to our... We're gone here, and we're going to add a new location where the uncle lives. He's at 62 Southwest. There. Okay. So I'm still in the thick of things. Should we follow this? Let's, let's just follow this lead down. Let's go talk to the uncle, 62 Southwest. Let's circle this. We'll note that we're going to 62 Southwest, which is the uncle, and 61 was Northwest. I got to remember to write the Northwest, and 75 Southwest. Okay, 62 Southwest.
We walk up to the large, imposing mansion at 62 Basil Street. However, despite our best efforts to sweet-talk the butler, including one of Wigan's most inventive and elaborate bluffs, which involves the Metropolitan Police, a chimney sweep, and an escaped llama, we are refused entry. Okay, he's a recluse. He doesn't want to talk to us. All right. No problem. He's not relevant. So we went, we went to... 62 Southwest. Okay. I'll make a little note there that that was useless. All right. We've talked to the trains. Do you want to keep following this lead and talk to the tutor and see if he has anything interesting? Um, in the comments, we say the top down is not so useful, but more summaries would be good. Like after reading the long passages, maybe summarize them briefly for us and reiterate the context. Right. So we went to the dead mother. The guy who was taking care of the house said it's the rich uncle is having me sell the house. We went to the rich uncle. He doesn't want to talk to us. So now we're back. I'm curious to, to wrap up the leads in the train house. So I'm going to, I think we go talk to the, um, the tutor who's at 75 Northwest. It looks like, where was, I've got 75 Northwest was the tutor. Did I not put a marker on the board for that? I guess I didn't. 75 sort Northwest. So we're going to see what he has to say about anything in the house. 75 Northwest. Okay, it's a nice paragraph here. Edgar Newmarch is a powerfully built man in his 30s. As he speaks, he puffs on a cigarette and runs his fingers through the light blonde hair of his mustache. That day I arrived, as usual, a little before 7 a.m. I normally speak with Miss Sturton as she prepares to go out, dressing in her warm winter coat and a sturdy pair of boots. The first time I met her, she explained her habit of taking routes through the park far from the established paths, and of course her everyday shoes would be no good for this. I was surprised at such a habit for a lady, and even more so when these walks continued as autumn came and went. It's almost like the walks are suspicious. That morning, she said that Duncan was low in spirits and asked me to keep an eye on him. She said she was taking her usual walk into Hyde Park. I have often told her to be careful walking alone in such areas, especially at this time of year when the light arrives late. It is ironic that, in the end, her encounter with danger occurred on a city street in the broad light of day. Once she had left, I settled the children down into their lessons. Duncan was coughing and finding it difficult to concentrate. Two hours later, Miss Sturton returned and I left. She was in good spirits on returning from her walk, and nothing seemed amiss. I don't believe she had any idea of what was about to befall her. He puts out his cigarette and looks straight at Wiggins. I hope you catch the villains responsible. So she goes for her long walk in the morning through Hyde Park and comes back safe. And then later when she goes out, they kidnap her. This guy, nothing really suspicious. Nothing really suspicious. Well, that was 75 Northwest. Um, nothing all that interesting. This is Edgar the tutor. It is interesting how he's like suspicious of her walks, right? But she's the one who hired us, so she's clearly not involved in it. I mean, she could be hiding some truth. But it seems unlikely, right? Well, I have a feeling we're going to be here all night. All right. 
it was 75 to tutor the rich uncle. We talked to the train. Um, all right. If we're curious about the, I guess thematically, we should probably talk to the chemists if we're hoping for eyewitnesses. We shouldn't dilly-dally on that too much. So let's go to the chemist. And if you'll remember, this is the same chemist who poisoned, um, who was responsible for the infant dying. We assume that's the chemist she goes to. We probably could go to, oh no, Sturton, she's the governor. She, does she live there? No, she arrives in the morning. Let's just look up. I mean, we could actually go to her house if she's in the directory. Certain. No, she's not in the directory. She's not. She's too. She's too lowly to have an address in the directory. All right. Let's go. Let's go to that chemist. So 72 Northwest is where we are assuming she went to the chemist, which is here. Okay, so we put a little marker saying that's where we're going. And we're going to look up 72 Northwest. Uh, I don't see any 72 Northwest. That seems odd. That seems exceedingly odd. But it's possible that it's not relevant. 72 Northwest, John Taylor. And I looked up Northwest. I mean, you would think there would be an entry for it, even if it was not. 72 Northwest is not in there, okay? Uh, 75 Northwest is the one we just went to. So that's the one that's green. What was this I just marked as green? Oh, that was the place we went. 72 Northwest, no entry for chemist. All right, well, we know the chemist is Taylor. Maybe he closed up shop because of the infant. Let's see if he's in, let's see if we can find him at his home. Taylor, Jeremiah, Do we, we don't know his first name. There's also another chemist, so we could. <clears throat> Death of an infant, Mr. Taylor gave her a pennyworth. The deceased was sent to Miss, the mother of the deceased was sent to Mr. Taylor on Wigmore Street, which is that chemist. I don't know why that's not in here. Okay, but let's try to find him at his home. 80 Southeast. Home. It's 80. I mean, we don't even know if this is the same guy and or if he's at his home, but we're going to try to find him at his home. 80 Southeast. So we're trying to find the chemist. We went to the chemist store and he wasn't there. There was no entry there, which seems odd. Like even for the game, like even if there was nothing useful, you would think, just trying to find 80 Southeast here. Yeah. Uh, you would think there would still be an entry for it, but 80 Southeast. Nope, no 80 Southeast. Well, that's strange. That's strange. Let's look up. I don't know if I want like a separate. I'm going to put a blue here since there was nothing there. It's 72 Northwest. Very strange. Let's look up the other chemist shop that we think is not, not likely. Maybe we're just assuming that that was Taylor's chemist 
and actually Taylor's Chemist is the one on 87 Southwest. No, we know it's Wiggins, we, Wiggins Street, Wigmore Street. So we know that's the chemist where they died. Okay, maybe she wasn't going to that chemist. Although I thought it said she was. I thought we confirmed it was things. Either way, we're going to check it. Oh, I guess. I don't know if we should write down when there isn't stuff there. But I'm going to write down that we went to 72 Northwest. No clue. Okay, the other chemist that's nearby is at 87 Southwest, which was here. Let's try going there. I guess this shouldn't be, oh, it should be here. Um, although we could use a different, we could use a, yet another, okay, 87 Southwest. Eighty-seven Southwest. Okay, so there is an entry for this drugstore. The man behind the counter at Keene and Ashwell recognizes Wendy Sturton from our description. She has been coming in here regularly over the past few months, so I assume someone in her household has taken ill. She comes for laudanum. And has she ever done anything unusual? A few weeks ago, she asked me how much laudanum is normal for a young child to take in case of a mild complaint. I said one must always be cautious with laudanum as it can be habit forming and patients find they cannot stop taking it. For a mild complaint, a very small amount should be administered. As she had been purchasing a great deal, I said that surely it was not all for one child. <laughs> She seemed flustered and did not really respond. I wondered if she had formed something of a habit herself and was consuming much of what she bought. Okay. So that's 87. So that's the chemist she was going to. So it was good that it's a different, it actually seems like it's a different chemist than the one that killed her, that killed the infant. So maybe not relate, not related. 87 Southwest. So this confirms our theory that much too much opium is being purchased for this kid. The mother's consuming it. Whether she's still giving a little bit to the kid or not, I don't know. Mother's an opium addict. The governess is uh, su surprised. Obviously, gover governess is not in on it. Does that mean the opium woman was being... The wife had reason to need the money? Maybe she orchestrated the kid. Either she orchestrated the kidnapping to get money. 2,000 pounds, that's too much money. Or she's being blackmailed and needed money. Yeah, don't know. Interesting. She needs her drugs, though. She doesn't want the governess gone. She needs her to pick up the drugs. Okay. Um, so we talked to the trains. We talked to the tutor. We tried to talk to the rich uncle. We found the chemist. Right? And it wasn't at 72 Northwest. It was at 87 Southwest. That was the chemist. Um, I've got some more notes here. 63 Northwest. That's the... That's the location where she was kidnapped. I'm tempted to go by and look at look at these nearby areas where she was dropped off and kidnapped to see if anyth anyone saw anything. So I think I'd like to check that out. And then there were a couple more leads I thought we could follow through. Um, talk to the doctor who's been caring for the, for the boy. 
and then we might want to start talking to some of our informants. So we, and then there's Hyde Park we could go check out. So do you remember what was here at 83? I think that might be the doctor. Yeah, that's their doctor. All right, let's go ask around, see if there were any witnesses at this area. So she was kidnapped on Curzon and Half Moon Street, I believe it was. Oh my glasses. She was kidnapped, yeah, right, right there. So actually on that corner there. All right, so let's just quickly look up some witnesses. So we're going to look at 63, 63 Northwest. 63 Northwest has a small section here. An old man with a monocle and a limp answers the door and looks us over. We ask him about the day of the kidnapping. He shakes his head. No, sorry. The police have already asked me, and I have told them, as I tell you, I saw nothing out of the ordinary on that day. Okay. So that was 63 Northwest. We probably should use, let's get a different color to use for clothes that are like totally worthless. So that one is like totally worthless. But, um, and then what was the other one that's totally worthless? Oh, 72, there was nothing there. Totally worthless. Okay. Um, well, there's a hotel nearby. I say we continue this, you know, you're good detectives, you gotta ask around, right? What do they call that when you canvass the area? Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna check out Piccadilly Hotel, which is right on that corner, which is at 26 Northwest. No, nothing at 26 Northwest. I write this down, no clue. No clue. And then the other one on that corner is 64. 64 Northwest is no clue. No clue. And then is there any sense in which it makes sense to think about her, her route? Where's our pen here? If we look top down, we've been dealing with this is this. This is where she was kidnapped. No one saw anything in these two places. Um, 61 was, so here, I mean, this is, it's kind of cool. It's kind of interesting. There's their house, right? There's the chemist. Here's where she was kidnapped on her way this way. So let's ask at 62, which she would have walked by. And mm, 60, would she have gone through 60, past 60, 62? Well, it is towards Hyde Park also, which we think she may have been driven, although she, it seems like it was further away. Um, but yeah, let's look up 62 Northwest. 62 Northwest is not in there. Boy, it's hard to avoid, hard to avoid looking at the other numbers, but thankfully I have a terrible memory. Northwest is no clue. Um, should we look up 27 just for the hell of it since we're there? 27, no. 27 Northwest, no clue. Okay. So if you're worried about spending time on leads, this is, you shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. You shouldn't be just hunting around canvassing. You should only follow the most promising leads, but I don't care about that. I'm here for the atmosphere. So no one saw anything around her kidnapping. I'm not sure why that would be. Um, well, while we're down here, should we head over to Hyde Park and see if we can see anything? Police are more likely to know about this than us, but, but let's go to Hyde Park and check it out. 95 Northwest. So if you remember, Hyde Park is where the suicides are, the suicides were of that mystery person 
That happened just a day ago or so. It's also where she liked to walk. 94 Northwest. We enter Hyde Park from the southeast. From the southeast. We enter Hyde Park from here. Okay. The path underfoot glimmers with a light frost and we wrap our coats and scarves tight about us to ward off the cold. <clears throat> There's a little note here. It says, consult the map of Hyde Park and choose where in the park you wish to go. Read the relevant numbered entry below. 95 Northwest does not count as a lead, but each location in the park counts as one lead. So the leads, again, you don't count the ones that are no clues. The other ones you do, this is just for scoring. So if you look at this, let's see if this will autofocus, which I changed it. So there's the park. There's the serpentine. So we can actually choose which area of the park we want to check out. So we've got in the park, the areas are the lodge, the serpentine. So the serpentine river comes through the park, it looks like. It's here, I think. This is part of the serpentine there. Can you see that? I think this is the river where we were talking about people were found dead. So we've got this, the, the plant nursery, the gunpowder magazine, the police station, the humane society. Ah, so there's our humane society item. Police station, gunpowder magazine. I don't know what that's saying. Is that a, I'm not sure what that's saying. The lodge or the plant nursery. So. If you cared about score, you'd care about not looking at the wrong thing. If you don't care about score, maybe you look at all of these. Let's make a big note, though, that um, Hyde Park, which is where we are, has actually a whole bunch of stuff in it. <laughs> all right. Okay. So it says don't count 95 against yourself when you count leads. Says don't count, but the others do. Um, so let's look at our newspaper um, about the suicide. On Wednesday near near Stanhope Gate, reports were made. So I don't see Stanhope Gate here, but I'll tell you what it looks to me. It looks to me, sorry, it looks to me like maybe this is Stanhope Gate across the, across the river, or maybe you don't have a gate across the river. Um, okay, so a Stanhope Gate, near the gate, there was a seat and the man was bleeding. There was a trail of blood on a path leading to the serpentine. Okay. Path leading to the serpentine. Um, they couldn't find him. They went to the Royal Humane Society house to tell them about it so they could search the serpentine or serpentine. And they were already told that there was a body and the, they found a body. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, Oh no, the revolver and poison are sometimes, there's even a guy hanging by a tree and there's a tree. The previous suicide was hanging by a tree near the gate and the police station. Okay, well, not, not that relevant for us, but let's, let's start out by um, looking at this lodge. I mean, we're probably gonna do all these, but I, let's start out with three. So this is 95.3 does count. And that's the lodge. I think we're going to look at all of these, but the lodge says the keeper's lodge is an imposing building flanked with columns of white stone. We knock at the door, but no one answers. Peering through a window, we can see some desks scattered with papers, but no sign of any people. We move down the side of the lodge into the backyard, a carriage is parked by some stables where three horses send white clouds of breath into the air and stamp their hooves. 
This is why I love this game. That the you can just picture you're back in the 1800s. There's a stable. The horses through. It's 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 winter. It's cold, right? Nice. Through a back window of the lodge, we see a dining room with a wooden table and chairs set in front of a grand fireplace. Now remember, she says she was kidnapped, held in a building. She said they started a fire, right? Wooden table, chairs, fireplace. So was the lodge, was the lodge the building where she was kidnapped, where she was held? Okay, so here's a little movie trope for you that could be relevant for our case. So a governess comes into the office, right? She says, I was kidnapped. I was driven around this for what seemed like ages in the city. We spent most of the time in the city, and then we got to the country. Now, when we initially read that, we thought, oh, they had to drive her pretty far then. This is just two blocks away. But what are we thinking now? What happens sometimes in the movies? They drive them around just to confuse them how far away they're being driven. So maybe they put her in the carriage and they just drive her around to disorient her, make her think she's dri being driven further away, and into Hyde Park they go into this lodge where no one is. It's an imposing building. We had to look through the, uh, through the back. To see into this window, we had to down the side into the backyard. So it's out of the way of peering eyes. There are horses, there are horses there. So obviously it's been used recently. Someone's taking care of those horses. Um, but there's no one there. Okay, so that is really very intriguing. Like, that's a very good candidate for the kidnapping. All right. Well, I think while we're here, we, we check out the rest of this Hyde Park, especially since it seems so relevant to us. Let me put this up here again so you guys who are, who are doing this at home can take screenshot and, uh, Study it. Okay, next up. Let's check out the Humane Society that we spent the first 20 minutes of this video wondering what it was. Okay, so we're going to 95.1. Royal Humane Society. Smoke rises from the chimney of a wide fronted building near the riverbank. On the door is a sign proclaiming this to be the receiving house for the Royal Humane Society. A pale man in a dark suit emerges, asking if he can be of any help. There's a lot of noise outside at 2 a.m. A pale man in a dark suit emerges, asking if he can be of any help. We ask him about Miss Thurton. Oh, I know, I know, Miss Thurton, he responds with a stutter in his speech. Uh, she, she, she walks in the park often. She, uh, on occasion, stops, uh, uh, stops to talk and ask me about our society's history. Which path would she normally take, asks Wiggins. Uh, he points northwards, p uh, past the police house, and by the old gunpowder magazine. She often did not stick to the path and would walk amongst the trees, even in the ice or snow. So he's telling us she walked north past the gunpowder magazine. Now, now we know what, what is a gunpowder magazine? That's going to be like a, what, a little, um, military, little station where they had a gun at some point to defend the place. I guess we're going to, we're going to, we're going to learn about that. We're going to learn some history here, but he's stuttering, but just cause he's got a stutter, right? Pale man in a dark suit. She asks about history. Could he be involved? Could he have seen her walking? I mean, 
it would make sense if the people kidnapping her, if they're using that building, are like the people who live in that area. They've just seen her long enough. They've talked to her. They know she's a governess for some rich people. Okay, let's make our way up this path. We're going to go to all these places. We're going to make our way up this path. So we're going to go now to the police station, which is 95.4. And then we'll, we'll follow her path the way we'll recreate her path. All right, police station. A lone policeman at a desk introduces himself as Constable Tyrrell. Wendy, Miss Sturton, comes by here on occasion, he says in response to our question, although she prefers walking away from the pass in the trees around the gunpowder magazine. Whenever she has come by, I think, and I hope I am not immodest in saying this, that she is always pleased to find me on duty. If I have the time, I'm very glad to sit and talk with her a while, and I believe we both enjoy each other's company. So he thinks this woman fancies her. Uh, what kind of things do you talk about? Uh, about the park, about things she has seen on her walks, about the matters of the day. We've also discussed the changes that have occurred over the years, from the creation of the Serpentine to the new police house. How do the changes in the park happen? asked Watson. Who makes the decisions? Various people. Simon Pickney oversized the building operations. The royal keeper of Hyde Park is Sir Colin Pickwick, though he is rarely here and chooses not to reside in the keeper's lodge. And Sir Colin's son and daughter, Patrick and Grace, help him manage the park affairs. What shifts were you on around the 16th of November when she was kidnapped? Tyrrell's expression darkens. Well, that was a strange incident, was it not? That week I was working the afternoon shifts, 12 till 7, and Constable Ponsford was working the morning shifts, 6 till 12. As I recall, I had asked to switch with Ponsford for that week, but he was adamant that he keeps the morning shifts. Thank you, Constable. Circle the letter L. That was a fascinating clue. Um, and you saw that new mechanic. We're supposed to circle the letter L. So we're going to go ahead and mark this. We're going to assume we're never going to sell this or trade this copy. So we're circling that we've learned about L. Circle the letter L. Okay. And I'll just mark here, circle L. So we actually got some very promising lead here, right? Because this guy tells us that the, he tells us a couple people responsible for the park. And then he says, uh, the keeper of the park is Colin Pickwick. So let's make a note here that the keeper of the park is Colin Pickwick. Colin Pickwick is the keeper, right? And he is the owner or the person who's supposed to reside in this lodge that we that seems suspicious. But he's rarely around. But who is around? His son and daughter. Patrick and Grace. Patrick and Grace Pickwick. Son and daughter, man and woman, which Our Lady says she thinks her kidnappers might have been. Right? They are looking like our prime suspects at this point. Um, and then he, we ask about the shifts, right? And he says, he says, um, Constable Ponsford, Ponsford worked from 6 a.m. to 12 noon at the park and was insistent about not changing 
morning shift. Now, 6 to 12, we know when she was kidnapped, right? What does our case tell us the timeline for her being kidnapped? Um, on the afternoon, she was an, uh, an errand to the chemist. So we aren't told in our introduction when she went. But we did talk to the family and the tutor. The tutor was at 75 Northwest. I mean, I think we know that this was when she was out there, but I, I think it's nice to like get all our ducks in a row. If we have to convince someone of our case, we should be able to say how we knew this is when she was kidnapped. So when we talk to the tutor, he says he gets there before seven. She goes for her walk. She goes for a walk to Hyde Park. Uh, two hours later, she returned and he left. She, so then she's going out later for the stuff. So I just want to make sure, like, it would be nice to lock in that she was kidnapped around that time. I mean, uh, does she say when she was kidnapped? On the afternoon, I was an errand. So she walks in the morning, and then she went the afternoon. So I'm assuming it was in that before noon when that other guy was working. But that's important. Like, if she was kidnapped at 1 p.m., then that other constable who wanted morning has nothing to do with anything, right? So I do think it's important that we lock down that she was kidnapped before noon. The other place that we were uh, might be told was at the trains. So let's see. So we know they get the we know they get the ransom note at 5 p.m. or it was found at 5 p.m. Um, it's interesting. Also, this is this is a bit of a clue, right? that she's kidnapped and then returned the next day, right? He's like, we find the ransom at 5 p.m. I call my uncle, but before he even got back to me, she's returned. So he has not told the kidnappers that he's not paying. Who told them that the ransom is not going to be paid? That's that's a real that's a serious question for us to answer, right? So who told kidnappers no ransom would be paid if indeed that's what it was all about? Um Okay, so here's you giving us more timeline. Uh, she takes her free time between seven and nine. That's when she went for her walk. She comes back at nine, prepares lunch, then does her chores. Was that her schedule? Yes. In the afternoon, Duncan could not eat his lunch. He was feeling unwell, so on one of her errands was to get some laudanum. So, it sounds like she probably went out around noon or uh, lunchtime, 11, 12. So probably either when this, she may have been kidnapped after this Ponsford guy finished his morning thing, but uh, he was there, definitely there. He was definitely there in the morning when she took her morning walk. Okay, well, Constable Ponsford, shall we look up? I mean, we do want to speak to him. He's suspicious. Shall we look up if he's in the directory? We haven't finished looking up the Hyde Park locations, too, but let's just see if Ponsford has a 
entry. Ponsford Maxwell is at 26 Southwest. Southwest, let's put a marker here. 26 Southwest. Does he live near the park? Not really. Okay, so uh, we would like to speak to him at some point, right? Because it's suspicious that he insisted he was on, he wanted to be on duty. Um, but let's let's follow this trail more. So ninety five. Let's talk to the tutor. We must have never expected to be paid. Yeah, it is. It is. Like, either they're hired and they're told, okay, let her go. Either it's a real kidnapping and they're told we're not going to get paid. But even if you're told you're not going to get paid, like, you don't kidnap someone, go to all the, uh, all the trouble to kidnap someone, and then... Issued a ransom, and then the person's like, "We're not going to pay," and you're like, "All right, have her back." Like, in one day, no. So either it wasn't a kidnapping at all, but why? But you're still telling her that it's a kidnapping. Yeah. All right. Well, it's a mystery. All right, and I see we've got someone new joining the channel remarking on my Sherlock Holmes pipe, which does help me think. This is a great, I'm gonna tell you one of my favorite movies. Wow, I can't remember it now. Can't remember the name of it. Uh, it's an indie movie. All right, this will be, we'll turn this into a quiz. It's an indie movie about, there's some, there's some detective work. It's something winter, and summer, winter, brother and sister. Uh, you'll have to at the next at the next live stream. I'll tell you about this movie that I love. It really has a soft spot in my heart for it, and it's got it. Well, okay. Frozen September. Uh, I don't know. Okay, next. Let's not get distracted. Next, next video. Okay, let's read the rest of this Hyde Park. Follow her along the path she took and see if we've got more clues. So next up, um, we've gone to one, it's Humane Society, then we went to the police station. All right, let's go past the gunpowder magazine and see what this gunpowder magazine is all about. Oh, it's a big entry here. Gunpowder magazine. As we approach the magazine, someone in the chat channel can do Wikipedia and tell us a little history about what a gunpowder magazine is. As we approach the magazine, Watson explains that such, what such a building is for. Okay, <laughs> cancel that, delay that order. We've got, Watson is telling us. It is a gunpowder store. The military positions them across the country in strategic locations. They are made to be secure, dry, and cool with very thick walls and are often built in wooden locations, wooded locations. The trees help to absorb the blast in the case of an explosion, which, of course, is an ever-present hazard. So, yeah, gunpowder magazines. These are probably real if you go. We stop at the mention of explosions, and Wiggins looks at Watson in disbelief. Explosions, Doctor, he says? And they have one of these in the middle of the park? More than one, I think, answers Watson. This is one of the most isolated spots in central London. Even if an explosion were to happen, and the walls and the trees, the range of the destruction would be limited. Thinking that, although limited, the range of destruction would be wide enough to encompass anyone standing next to it, we follow Watson with some trepidation towards the magazine. So this is a good hideout spot. It is a hexagonal building with no windows and a very sturdy looking door, which is locked. Next to the door, the words Gunpowder Magazine are carved in the stone, and ivy creeps up to the building's midpoint. This looks old, observes Wiggins. Is it still used? 
I think not, says Watson. I'd say it was built at least a century ago, and I see no sign of any guards. But someone has visited, says Wiggins. There are many shallow wheel tracks coming from the west. It looks like a small cart has made regular trips here over the past few months. Interesting. He turns around and takes a few steps. And over here are men's footprints and a set of more recent wheel marks, wide and deeper. A large wagon came to the door and then turned and went back the same way. And what's this? He picks something up from the ground near the door of the magazine. Looks like an expensive brand, he says, holding up a cigar for us all to see. It is almost complete, but the end of it is charred, indicating it has been lit and briefly smoked. From the state of it, it must have lain in the dirt for a few days to where our kidnapping happened. And I reckon this place must be out of use, Wiggins continues, tucking the cigar into his shirt pocket. Unless whoever smoked this doesn't know what happens when you mix cigars and gunpowder. Circle the letter C. So that C is going to stand for cigar, which we are going to go to a tobacconist and see if he can identify who might smoke such cigars. All right, so let's make a note. This high park was like full of great stuff. And we discovered it because we know she walks by this way. They say she walks through the park and also because of that death in the Hyde Park. That is very suspicious. So that was 95, five, that was the gunpowder. And that had a circle C. Now, we also learned a little bit about a little bit of history of London. You gotta build these giant defensive stations. Okay, and we circled C. All right. And um, were there any other clues in that gunpowder magazine? Yes, the cigar. Okay, so we should, we have a cigar now, right? So we want to check the tobacconists. Now, he actually said a lot of stuff that was interesting there about the wagons, um, which is going to be tricky for us to remember. But let's, let's read again what he says. So they've got this gunpowder magazine. It's another potential building that they could have kidnapped her in, right? So it could be in that lodge house or they could have kidnapped her in the, into this gunpowder place. Um, and it's again, it's isolated. Okay. The door is locked. Is it still used? It's not used. It's built a century ago. I see no sign of any guards. Okay. So, Uh, they are made to be secure, often built in wooded locations. So um, we're not there. Are, there may be no, there may be no um, gunpowder in here, right? He says it was built a century ago. No guards, so they're not being used. Um, but Wiggins, which is one of, who is one of our regulars, the head of the regulars, we're like one of the we're one of his friends. He says, someone's visited. There are shallow wheel tracks coming from the west. Okay, from the west. Shallow ones. Small cart make regular trips here over the past few months. So maybe using this as a storehouse for something, opium? I don't know, for something, storehouse. Shallow wheel tracks, like a wheelbarrow. Recently, over the past month. But then over here are more recent wheel marks, wide and deep. That might be the carriage with people in it, three people in a carriage. A large wagon came to the door, turned and went back the same way. 
Then he founds the, finds the cigar, an expensive cigar, expensive cigar. Just been smoked a little bit. Um, and from around the time of the kidnapping. It's out of use unless whoever smoked this doesn't know what happens. Right, he's saying it's not in use. There's probably no gunpowder in here because no one would be smoking a cigar if there really is gunpowder in here. So it's storing something else. Okay, lots of good clues. It sounds like they're using this building for storing something, perhaps. So maybe that wasn't where she was kept. Okay. Let's do our last clue in Hyde Park, which is following up this path to the north to the plant nursery. Okay, so 95.2. Sounds like an FM radio station. Plant nursery. At the plant nursery, we wander amongst the greenhouses, noting many plants we recognize and many we don't. Some of the greenhouses are dedicated to varieties brought from all over the world. At the back is a small lodge with a line of small carts outside. We knock and get no answer, but the door is unlocked. The room on the other side of the door contains some chairs and a table with an inkwell and blotting pad, a small green wooden box and a delivery list. Circle the letter J. So, I mean, we've, we've stumbled on the lair here at Hyde Park, for sure. So this is an interesting mechanic with the circling. I wonder if, uh, if Greg is listening, what he thinks about this new mechanic where you circle things. We've just circled things, clues. At some point, they're going to ask us what we've discovered. Um, so there's actually a giant list here. Let me show you. So it's a delivery list. It's long delivery list. Let's see what kinds of things it says here. January to September, A25 to A32, CA40 to CA46, CH37 to CH41. It's interesting. It's two no two letters and a number goes to the same two letters and a different number. And the numbers are always going up. So A25 to A32, CA40 to CA46. Okay. And that's under January to September. Any idea what these letters might be? A, C, A, C, H, I, N, I, R, W, I. Don't know. January to September, 1885. So it is our year and it's the previous months. Everything stopped in October. Um, okay, and then under that, we've got deliveries. 24th October, A33, origin Morocco, destination central nursery, received by C. Nutaz. Next delivery, 25 October, WI46. So if you note, these deliveries are the numbers following this. Like for example, in our list, we've got A25 to A32 and the delivery was A33. The next delivery is WI46, whereas in our list, we've got WI29 to WI45. So it's, more, it, oh, it's almost like this is the summary of the things that got delivered. And then here are the new deliveries. Not in future though, these were past. So the first origin is Morocco and destination is Central Nursery. 
Then the next day, WI, okay, WI is West Indies. So that makes you think that these numbers, these letters are origins for these plants, for these opium plants possibly, I mean West Indies. Again, Destination Central Nursery, this time received by Grace Allende. Then we've got a week passes and we're in November, another delivery of the A type. Origin Morocco, again, signed by the same person at the same place at Central Nursery. Same day, another West Indies delivery gets made, again by the Central Nursery, and again received by Grace Allende. So it's like right one after the other, C. Nutaz is getting one of these deliveries from Morocco, and Grace is getting the delivery from the West Indies. This is happening on the same day. First November, Nutez or signs for the Morocco and Grace. You know, I've been wondering what's that sound? It's the cat. The cat is snoring over here. The cat is snoring on the chair over here. That's the sound. I thought it was like a pigeon roosting outside. It was the cat snoring. All right. So, New Taz Grace, New Taz Grace, and then New Taz again, 3rd November, is the last one we have here. Ireland is IR. So these letters are definitely deliveries from these countries. Ireland, West Indies, Indochina, Morocco. A is Morocco. There's probably a reason why A refers to Morocco. So do we think they're growing opium? They're, this is like the, <clears throat> this is the drug station for the opium. The thing is, uh, if laudanum is not illegal, oh, so laudanum itself, the opium is legal, but maybe they're dealing with higher quantities of drugs. Okay, so we've got a lot of clues here though that we're gonna have to worry about, or not clues, but people. So let's make a new page here. I think we're gonna, for the nursery, plant nursery, okay. So we've got, we've got central nursery. Are these, like we're in the plant nursery, but this isn't gonna be the central nursery, right? There's gonna be a different central nursery. So at the central nursery, we've got two people we care about. C. New Taz or New Taz or Taz or something. Can't really read the handwriting. And then Grace Allende. These two people are signing for stuff. I do note that the last delivery is on the 3rd of November. And the kidnapping's on the 13th. So actually quite some time goes by. So are they, are they running out of, um, if these people are dealing drugs and they kidnap the woman Maybe to put some pressure on the family. Don't know. Okay, but um, yeah, so a plant nursery. We reckon the greenhouses, small line of carts, so moving back stuff back and forth between the, the nursery and that uh, gunpowder magazine maybe. And they've cleared out. They've completely cleared out, like the gig is up for them. And they had to clear out in a hurry because they left that document there. All right, but we'd want to go to the central nursery where we want to talk to these two people. I mean, that's high on our list, right? And we want to go to the, mag the tobacconist. Let's see if we can get addresses for the central nursery and maybe these two people. Uh, and then maybe we'll take a five-minute break. 
So let's look up nursery and see if he's in here. There's tobacconist. We'll want to look at that in a second. All right, so there's no nursery section. Let's see if we can look up alphabetically by central nursery. I think in, I'm trying to remember if some if the other short homes had a residential directory and then a commercial directory. This one I think has them all combined. So there's no central nursery. Let me write down this was 95 point, just in case we have to come back to this, 95.2. Are we still keeping track of our places we went? Yes. So um, is this the central nursery? It's not central, right? So there's got to be another central nursery, right? I guess we could look up these people, New Taz and Allende. Let's look up them. Um, Allende is the A. Is she the one getting the A's? Put a little mark here. No, Allende is getting the West Indies. All right, let's see if we can find these people. Unless that was code, right? I mean, it's possible that the central nursery is code. I don't see any new tags. Let's make sure we could read that properly. It's a little hard to read. C N E Oh, I think it's Nestor. I don't think that's a W. I think that's a now that I look at it closely. I guess you should use your glasses if you're a detective. I think that says Nestor. C Nestor now. All right, well, let's see if there's a Nestor. How much of good detective work is actually being able to read your own notes? I'm like note taking. Do you think they give them like intensive courses on taking good notes? I hope so. There's Clyde Nestor, 11 EC. That's going to be our C Nestor. In one of the games we played, Greg and I, detective modern crime board game, there were some, a couple of clues that had writing on them that we couldn't figure out what it said. And it's hard to know how much time you should spend. I mean, it's kind of cool. You get a clue that you can't quite read. You could, you could think that that might break your case if you're tracking some serial killer or whatever trying to figure out the what the notes say like that could crack your case wide open maybe you spend weeks trying to figure out what it says all right let's look up grace and day so i don't see her We need to go make sure we're not reading that wrong, too. That one's actually quite easily printed. A-L-L-E-N-D-E. -E. Yeah, she's not in there, Grace Allende. But they're both at, doing it the same place at Central Nursery. All right, let's take, a, let's take another quick browse through this directory and see if we can't find... I'm also going to look her name somewhere else. There's forests. Government offices. Hospitals, hotels, insurance companies, jewelers.
sport association. There's a rowing club, a cricket club. Let's make a note that we might want to check the stables where horses are and stuff. That's one of our um, informants we can go to. There's also stables in here, central carriage. I don't see central. I don't see the nursery here, central nursery, unless they're referring to us. But I would, uh, I, I will make a note and write down here that if these drugs are coming in internationally, that might be a good thing to talk to the foreign national office about if they know about dr drug trade, if that's what we think is going on. Okay, it's been three hours, 20 minutes or so. Let's take a little uh, five minute break.
Okay, we are back. Let's check in with our comments. We've got Greg is in the comments. That's the closest you can get is Greg in the comments. Why, if he's awake, well, I don't know why, well, I do know why he can't be here because of uh, COVID concerns, but hopefully you guys will see Greg soon. It is more fun to play these with Greg. Okay, Greg asks, in addition to his normal jokes, he's asking if there are any articles in the newspapers regarding the doors. Uh, I just went through it again. I don't see any, um, I don't see any articles about any deliveries. There definitely are newspapers in this one. And there actually were quite a few interesting things related to our case in here, including a suicide at the park. I did notice one other thing is that the matriarch of the family died on October 26th, down here somewhere, 75. And October 25th is when the last delivery in October was. So coincidence, maybe. I do think that those deliveries were probably the receiving. So there is no, maybe that nursery meant that plant nursery that we're at, they received them. So I'm very keen to talk to that guy who signed for some of these deliveries. I don't remember what we put here. Was this the, um, what was 80? Let's look at all, over some of our pending clues here. 80 was, no, this is why you keep good notes so you could see. We've got a note that the chemist, oh, the chemist's home was at 80 Southeast. There was nothing there. That was our mistake, and we were tracing down the wrong chemist. I hope that's right. And then up here at 83 WC. What clue is that? That was our doctor who was caring for the boy who had a cough. So we still haven't talked to him yet. 26 Southwest, I believe that's our constable who we still haven't talked to, right? Yeah, that's our constable. And now we've added a new one, which is 11 EC, which we almost forgot to put this marker on which is the person who signed the receiving of these plants. All the way over there. So, I mean, I am thinking, I am thinking that they're involved in some drug, international drug smuggling but it still doesn't explain the kidnapping. Or the uncle. Remember the rich uncle. Okay. Well, what shall we do? Shall we talk to the I think we, we've got this very good lead, right? These plants, so maybe we follow that down. I want to talk to the tobacconist. Um, we got three clues circled at Hyde Park. One was the cigar. One were the plants. I forget what the L was for. The C was for cigar. Boy, that Hyde, that Hyde Park one was just filled with clues. So... We circled uh, J was the was the delivery list, and then L was the the constables working hours were weird. So tobacconist, constable, and and the delivery guy. What's um. Let's go to the delivery. Let's track down this guy 
who signed for the delivery. 11 EC. Eleven EC. Okay, let's write down on our sheet. Make a new sheet, I guess. Okay, eleven EC. And this is our uh, nursery signer. Okay. The landlady at number 11 tells us she lets rooms to two people, Thomas Pleasant and Clyde Nestor, but neither of them is at home. Do you know where we might find Clyde? asked Wiggins. We're uh, friends of his and have some news to give him. He works as a manager of something at Hyde Park, she replies. Something to do with plants and shrubs and the like. But I don't think he will be there now. I had an old wardrobe I wanted rid of, and he went off with it about 20 minutes ago, saying he had seen a way he could get some money for it. Wiggins thanks her, and we take our leave. Circle A. Hmm. Not sure why. So we've tracked down this guy. We've circled A. Nursery signer, I'm going to write down here that we circled A. We're supposed to remember to put this here when we're there. So, there was someone else there, right? It wasn't, she said she lets this same room to two people. And the other one was Thomas Pleasant. Now, Have we heard that name before? Thomas Pleasant, has that come up in any of our research before? Hmm. I don't know, but let's keep it in mind. All right, uh, and is this just a, nothing to do with our case? He does with plants, she had an or, old wardrobe and he says he's seen a way he could get some money for it. Hmm. Thomas Pleasant. Well, I mean, if he's in the directory, it's going to be pointing to the same area. So I'm not sure how that helps us. Well, that lead kind of got run down. If we can't find the woman. Allende, you think that's a fake name? Based on uh, Chile? Was Allende in Chile? Someone put in the comments where Allende was the ruler of. All right, well, let's go talk to our suspicious constable. And he was in 26 Southwest, down here. He's the constable, if you remember, who refused to change the morning shift. 26 Southwest. Constable Ponsford has an oval face and a bushy brown beard. As he answers the door, he removes the smoking stub of a cigar from his mouth and pushes it into an overflowing ashtray on a sideboard. Next to the ashtray is an open green box full of expensive looking cigars. So expensive cigar, that's the kind we found. Green box was the green, there was a green box where the receipts were at the nursery. We are working with Sherlock Holmes and uh, Inspector Lestrade, says Wiggins, and would like to ask you about Miss Wendy Sturton. Do you know her? Yes, Ponsford replies. I've only spoken to her a couple of times. My colleague, Constable Terrell, has conversed with her regularly. A report stating she'd been kidnapped went around the stations earlier this week. Why are you asking about her? We're helping with the kidnapping investigation. We were told you were on shift 
in the Hyde Park Police House on the morning of November 16th. Well, Ponsford pauses and thinks, yes, I was. And did you see Miss Sturton that day? We understand she used to walk by there most mornings. Uh, did she? Uh, he pauses, thinking again, and then something seems to occur to him. For a brief moment, his eyes widen before his expression settles back into a stern composure. Sorry, I don't remember. I'm not sure I can be of much help. You must excuse me. I have some paperwork to file. That was strange, says Watson, as we walk away. He was suddenly keen to be rid of us. So he's definitely knee deep in here. But he sounded like he was almost surprised. She used to walk there. Uh, yeah, he's lying about seeing her. He says, I don't remember. I'm not sure being come. I guess he's not surprised by anything. He knows about the kidnapping. Did you see her that day? She used to walk by. All right, so he's suspicious, and he's he sounds like he's doing the drug dealing, and it's his cigar. So let's make a note. We think... Is Greg going to, someone's going to complain that like my voices are changing in the middle of, I can't remember. <laughs> Here's a lesson. Like someone needs to start like YouTube classes for board game channels who need to read voices. Like if you need to read voices. Okay, so Ponsford Cigar Smoker. If we had to guess, we'd probably guess he's the cigar smoker and he's involved in these these uh, deals boy I mean if we didn't trust our woman who's so preternaturally calm if she wasn't the one who came in if we had reason to suspect her wouldn't you think that she's like involved in this drug operation but she's I mean it would make no sense at all for us for her to be coming in trying to get us help us solve this case so she can't be involved and she's not She's running errands for them, but the errands are just picking up the kid's medicine. All right. Well, we're running out of open clues. We're going to have to soon start going to our, some of our informants. But we still have the tobacconist um, that maybe will reveal that our constable is somehow got enough money to afford these expensive cigars. I did notice something in the newspaper. Um, so, Amber and Company, high quality cigars and cigarettes for the dis discerning smoker, imported from colonies worldwide. Like, that makes sense that our guy importing drugs from worldwide would get a taste for foreign cigars. So, there is a whole list of tobacconists in the directory. But let's check this one out 35WC. So 35 WC is the cigar shop, expensive cigar shop. Let's see, where is that? WC 35. Right there. Okay, in the same area where, where Hyde Park is. So let's check there. Let's see if they can match the cigar. It's not possible that the deliveries are like illegally illegal cigars, right? That would be crazy. It's got to be plants. Okay. Although that guy was complaining about smoking in the park. Still doesn't tie into our kidnapping. Like we've discovered this little side problem, but I don't see why. And let's not forget this. Hold on a second. I mean, one of our huge biggest clues which we never looked up their location were the Pickwick kids, right? Who have access to that house. Patrick and Grace Pickwick. All right, let, before we forget, before we track down tobacconist, let's look up Pickwick and see if we can't find these two because they're deep in it. We almost overlooked them.
I keep trying to think of that movie. It's got like a date in it. It might be like September, November. It's an indie movie. There's a mystery involved. It's like mumblecore genre, which I really love. Oh, Pickwick. Pickwick, Sir Colin, that's the father. 58 South W. Okay, let's go visit the father and see if he knows where what his kids have been up to. 58 South, South W. Okay, here we go. First use of the new mechanic. Do you have circled L? If not, you are nothing at 58. Go elsewhere. If you do, read on. So we do have, where's our, where's our sheet? So we do have L, we do have L circled. We discovered it at Hyde Park. It's probably when we just, we learned about Pickwick um, at, the, at the park. So we do get to read this. We explain that we work for the consulting detective Sherlock Holmes and we are ushered into an oak paneled office. A moment later, a slim man bounds into the room. I am Sir Colin Pickwick, he exclaims and gives a slight bow, which we each with some uncertainty return. How can I be of help? Well, Sir Colin, begins Wiggins, we are investigating a kidnapping and there may be a connection to Hyde Park. Could you tell us about your role as keeper? Sir Colin snorts. My role as keeper of Hyde Park involves overseeing everything, and it is tedious. My son and daughter manage much of it for me, as if I allowed it to occupy more than a jot of my time, I would have died of boredom by now. They even give me a house, you know. Back in 83, when I accepted the post, the keeper's lodge in the middle of the park. Well, I have this place and I'm happy with it. So I let Grace and Patrick use the lodge as a base from which to manage park affairs. I do still make some high level management decisions. For example, I liaised with the Metropolitan Police about the repositioning of the park stations. And I am considering much more such changes. I ordered a census and a review of all the buildings in the park, which had just begun and will be complete by Christmas. Hmm. He ordered a census. Oh, you can't even see me doing my funny stuff. Okay, I ordered a census and review of all the buildings in the park, which had just begun and will be complete by Christmas. All of the buildings, asked Wiggins, including the old gunpowder magazine? Yes, that is due to be assessed tomorrow. It has stood empty for years, and it would be good to find a use for us. Who is it that was kidnapped? Wendy Sturton, a governess. Do you know her? No, the name is not familiar. Where will we find your son and daughter? You'll find them here, Sir Colin turns to his butler. Tell Patrick and Grace there are some gentlemen who work for a consulting detective. I'm sure they will find this whole thing quite amusing. As the butler leaves, Sir Colin rises. I'm afraid you must excuse me, he says, grinning. I have an appointment with a bottle of scotch in the next room. He has only been gone a moment when a young man and woman enter. Like his father, Patrick Pickwick exudes excess energy, rubbing his hands and his eyes, rubbing his hands as his eyes move across each of us in turn. They are full of energy, cocaine energy. <laughs> Patrick, and they're all thin and slender and full of energy as his eyes move across each of us in turn. Grace, in contrast, stands quite still, but has something lively about her expression. They both stare at us for a moment as if we are an exhibit in a zoo. Do you chaps really work for a private detective? Asks Patrick. When we answer in the affirmative, he grins and his sister claps her hands. How exciting, she says. Is he coming too? He might be, says Wiggins evasively, but you could be of great help to him and us if you answer our questions. Patrick, she says, adopting a serious expression, we need to help. 
Patrick opens a small green box on the desk. Another green box. These are the boxes that all the stuff gets shipped in. So everyone involved has one of these green boxes. He removes two cigars, handing one to his sister and taking one for himself. Is it all importing cigars? What do you do in... <laughs> Everyone's a cigar smoker. What do you do in terms of managing the park, asks Wiggins. Everything, Patrick responds. We spend much of our time there. Mr. Wiggins. What a delightful name, exclaims Grace. Patrick smiles. Mr. Wiggins. The park affairs quickly bored my father, and he began transferring his responsibilities to us. Well, initially to me. At that point, Grace was still gallivanting. Gallivanting, really, Patrick? Ha <laughs> ha, Grace laughs. I was abroad. My husband owned plantations, and I traveled with him to some of the most curious places. Have you ever been to the West Indies, Mr. Wiggins? No, ma'am, replies Wiggins, visibly embarrassed at the amusement his name is causing. Grace returned when her husband died of some awful tropical illness, says Patrick. Unfortunately, they had only been married for eight months, and the family wrangled things, so the bulk of his estate went to them. Poor Eduardo, Grace nods. Watson tries to get the conversation back on track. Do you know Mr. Wendy, Mrs. Wendy Sturton? No, responds Patrick. Who is she? A governess who was kidnapped last week. Kidnapped, exclaims Grace. How exciting, like something from a penny dreadful. Yes, responds Wiggins. Mr. Sturton, Mrs. Sturton walked regularly in Hyde Park. As do hundreds of people, Mr. Wiggins, says Patrick. We do not know them all. Our dealings are with the workforce rather than the public visitor. Very well, says Wiggins. Thank you for your help. Circle the letter F. So you get the feeling that some of these circles are going to be like when we get our score. All right, now let's look in the comments and see if anyone's still awake and making fun of me. No, not really. I mean, they're still making their comment from before. So let's take a break and try something new. Coke with coffee. Sounds like a horrible idea, but if it's ever going to be of value to us, now is it. Okay, so this is our little intermission taste testing. Vanilla, it's actually vanilla, vanilla flavored Coke with Pepsi. There's another one too. That is not bad. It's actually not so bad. We think these two are the kidnappers. I do. Why are they in such a good mood? They're like all coked up. They're not taking this thing seriously at all. It maybe suggests that like this wasn't a very serious thing. They never intended to keep her. Is that why they're not that concerned about this? Like they they did it like they were hired as a um they were hired to kidnap her as a distraction and what are they smuggling is it cigars i mean we know the mother is an opium addict But her opium is not coming from drug deals. It's coming from the doctor's prescription. Right? So, and these people are all on cocaine. So, they don't seem that related. Okay, so that was the Pickwick's house, which was 
eight uh, what number was that Pickwick's 58 South W and let's just make a note that we circled F and let's make a note that we went to 58 South W Pickwick so they're all happy. They think this is a fun joke. Kidnapped. How exciting. Yeah, so they're... If they are the kidnappers, which it really sounds like they are, right? Like that lodge house seemed like it was the place they kidnapped. And he's got the green boxes of cigars, which suggests that they're in on it. Okay, what was our 35 South WC? That was the cigar shop. Let's go to the cigar shop and trace down this lead about cigars and see if, remember, we don't know if this is the only cigar shop. So 35 South W. That's not South W. 35 WC. 35 WC. Do you have a circled C? That's the cigar we found. If you do, if you do not, if not, do not find anything useful at the place. If you do, read on. Okay, so we found this tobacconist in the newspaper. We, because we have the cigar, we can read on. The, the man behind the counter at Amber & Co. examines the partly smoked cigar we found in Hyde Park. We do sell cigars like this, but because of the very high cost, sales are limited. These cigars are rare and subject to a very high import tax. West Indies tobacco wrapped in banana leaf. Could you perhaps tell us the names of anyone who buys these cigars? Asked Wiggins, hopefully. A few people have a regular order with us, he says, glancing down at a list behind the desk. The names are Sir Francis Clarendon, Oswald Mason, and Stephen Kraust, but many other gentlemen purchase these from us, and I'm afraid we will have no record of those transactions. Okay. So, it's an expensive cigar and imported from the West Indies, where the deliveries are coming from. But most interesting was the high import taxes, right? So, so the cigars are West Indies imports with high tax. Okay, so as you know, there's actually a big, huge criminal underworld involved in smuggling cigarettes and still today because the taxes are so high. So being able to sell them on the black market and not pay import taxes is a huge source of revenue for underworld. So it would make sense if the this nursery was getting, taking in illegal shipments from abroad. The West Indies one may be the cigars, but there was another one that's possible, like it could be drugs and cigars being imported. Um, the guy whose house we visited because he signed for the the receipts, uh, Nestor, he was getting things from Morocco, and it was Grace Allende who was getting them from the West Indies. Oh, hold on a second. I almost missed that, but Gra Grace is the daughter. Grace it's Grace Pickwick, but she's signing it Allende. She's signing it a fake name, but it's Grace. 
Okay, so Grace is the one signing for the West Indies delivery, which is the cigars. So she's involved with the illegal cigar trade. And maybe that's why she doesn't treat this so seriously because she's just skipping import taxes. She figured it's no big deal. Okay, we found who Grace is. And Nestor's, the one who's, Nestor who's the other one was the guy who's not at home. The thing that jumped out at me a little surprising about Nestor is like, he was living in a rental house and the landlord was like, I got this cabinet I need to get rid of. He's like, I think I know where I can get a little money for it, from it. So like, he's not raking in a lot of money, right? But it does make me think that those two were the kidnappers. Could be falsely. It might not be them. But they are the ones that have access to that house. And that house with the fireplace did seem to me like the likely kidnapping place. But why? Why did they kidnap her? Remember, they didn't kidnap her from the park. Oh, and that's why the that's why the police officer. Um, okay, so I think <clears throat> the police officer thing I think is a little bit of a red herring. I think maybe he was surprised. Like he insists he's there during the morning shift because he's letting the deliveries come in. Right, he's involved in this illegal import of either drugs or just tobacco cigars. He. He's not involved in the kidnapping. I don't think he knew there was a kidnapping going on. He didn't make the connection until we confronted him. I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. But it's still not clear. It's still a weird connection to the kidnapping, right? Like, I feel like we've got two separate things going on, and it's not clear where. And it's weird that our girl... Uh, Sturton, she's like always going through the park, right? She's walking through the park constantly. She's like walking amongst their illegal stuff. But she's kidnapped, for, you know, in town while picking up the drugs. I mean, boy, she would be so suspicious to me if she wasn't the one who came in. It's almost like, like they didn't ask her any questions, right? Like you would, you might believe that they like kidnapped her to find out if she knew anything and let her go when she didn't, pretending it was a kidnapping, but they didn't ask her any questions. In fact, she says in the introduction, right? Like they didn't even want to talk to her. Um, so let's read this again. She stayed overnight. She was in the carriage she brought there. She couldn't sleep. There were movements and sounds that indicated to me that there was someone else in the room. A fire was kept burning, and occasionally I would smell tobacco, though I am not a smoker myself. I asked where I was being kept and what they wanted. After I had asked perhaps 20 times, my captor became sick of my questioning, and finally I received an answer. We're just waiting for a payment, miss. Then you can go. Be patient. Well, Dr. Watson, it is hard to be patient when one is tied to a chair and held captive in some unknown place. But I told myself there was nothing I could do, so I waited. At one time, a soft voice spoke to me and asked if I needed anything. I think it may have been a woman's voice, but I cannot be sure. I asked for water and was duly given some. On the next day, I heard movement and whispering. And then a man said loudly, said loudly, as if he wants her to hear that this is the fake thing, right? They're not going to pay. Let's release her. 
So it wasn't a kidnapping. I was taken back to the carriage. Shortly afterwards, I was told to step onto the street. I did so. It was a few moments. Okay, so I'm thinking... Well, I was going to say something else, but no, I got to back up now. The moment she's kidnapped, the moment she's taken, they say. Oh, no, 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 sorry. They kidnap her. They say, sorry if that was a little rough. It'll be easier now. It was strange because they're so nice to her. Then they keep her there overnight. She's asking, what's going on? What's going on? Then only after her repeated questions, overnight, the next day, they say, we're just waiting for payment. Then you can, be, then you can go. And then they talk loudly so she'll hear, her, hear them. They're not going to pay. Let's release her. So it feels like there was never a kidnapping. Uh, there was never an attempt to get ransom. It's, that's all fake. We don't know if they left the note or not, but it sounds like they want her to think that she was being ransomed. They want everyone to think that she was being ransomed, but they really kidnapped her for some other purpose. Um, now, it's possible she was even the wrong person kidnapped. We should keep Keep, uh, at least keep that in mind. But I don't think there was any ever, ever any pressure to get, they didn't want money. They never wanted money. They were either just holding her for a delay and they wanted this delay for some reason, or they were holding her um, by mistake, wrong person, or they were holding her maybe to pressure someone or to find out if she knew anything, but they weren't asking her any questions. So it wasn't to find out if she knew anything. All right, I feel this part. I, there's the doctor who's caring for the son. I don't think he's relevant to our case, but it's the only pink cube we have left. So let's go talk to him, 83WC. Let's see if he's got anything to say. He's the doctor that was treating the boy with the cough. I have a feeling that's a total red herring, but 83WC. We explain the reason for our visit and Dr. Richards confirms that he is the doctor for the train family. I do not know if what I tell you will bear any relation to these kidnappings, but I have visited the trains twice this year. The first time was around May or June, when Mrs. Train was ill with influenza, which lasted many weeks. She recovered, but soon after, in August, I was called to see Duncan, who was suffering from a wheezy cough. I felt sure it was an allergic reaction caused by pollen from a rare type of chrysanthemum. I recalled that being a problem last year when the train's previous maid, Mrs. Carth, used to buy them all the time and put them around the house until we realized the problems they were causing for Duncan. But Mr. Train assured me that they no longer kept any flowers in the house and certainly not any chrysanthemums. In the case of both Mr. Train, Mrs. Train and her son, there was little I could do but suggest they take laudanum, uh, laudanum and rest. Thank you, Dr. Richards, says Wiggins. You've been most helpful. Hmm. Well, I mean, that wasn't totally unrelated. That was 83 WC. So... It's hard to tell if that was red herring stuff though, right? Like, that's the doctor. And the doctor says two interesting things, right? He said chrysanthemum allergy. So either he's a quack, it has nothing to do with chrysanthemum, or there's a reason 
chrysanthemums are being brought into this house somehow. And then he mentions something else, right? He says, um, there was a previous maid, Miss Carth. So is it like, I was going to say, did they kidnap her thinking by accident, thinking they were kidnapping the previous maid, but she's been working there a year, right? Not a month. But Miss Carth, um, they don't have any more flowers, chrysanthemums. She, Mrs. Carth used to buy them and put them around the house until we realized the problems they were causing for Duncan. So, is it possible that our woman, Sturton, is doing these errands and delivering delivering drugs to the house without even knowing it? Hmm. Let's, uh, let's look up Mrs. Carth. And there's also, like... We could go to the flower shops and look about, trace down this, this, um, this chrysanthemum thing, but like nursery chrysanthemum is, is, are one of the nurseries being used to deliver drugs? All right, let's look up, let's see if Karth is in here. And then I think it might be time to, to, check on some of our um, our informants so I want to talk to the previous maid maybe she can tell us something about the family into some bad business or something Carth Wilma Carth 81 SW previous maid of the trains. I do feel like the more we can get at the tr train's household and figure out what was going on there, the better. And then maybe we want to go to some plant shops around this area. Yeah. All right, let's go to uh, 81 SW and see Karth Old. This is the old maid. Let's see if she has any gossip on why she was fired or whatever. 81 Southwest. <clears throat> Wilma Carth is a tall, thin woman in her 20s. I used to work for the trains as governess and maid, and indeed I would regularly buy flowers from Walden Box. We had to stop when we discovered one of them, I think, it was the chrysanthemums, was giving little Duncan some wheezing and making him unhappy. What else could you tell us about the trains, asked Wiggins. Well, they were a pleasure to work for, Wilma replies. Never had any trouble. A really respectable, God-abiding family blessed their souls. I only stopped working there because I was getting married. My circumstances were changing for the better. She smiles broadly and holds up her hand to show us a gold ring. We congratulate her and thank her for her help. So Walden Box is the flower shop that she used to go to. You see why you can probably see why why these Sherlock Holmes why I talk about the theme and the atmosphere like the writing the quality of the writing is a magnitude different than these other paragraph games that we played like Ellery Queen and whatever where there's just like a little snippet of information this these are you know 
she's happy she's getting married and moving to better things. Okay, but they didn't fire her. She doesn't know any bad gossip about the family. She was happy there. She says they're a good family. So I'm inclined to think that they are a good family. Like she would know, the maid would know if there was some bad stuff going on. But let's check out Waldenbach's uh, nursery just in case they are not on the up and up. Waldenbach Forest is 24 Northwest. 24 Northwest. Okay. So we're going to go to 24 Northwest. Let's put a little marker on it. 24 Northwest, which is probably pretty near the house. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And then we put a marker showing that we're going to that location. What's here that we didn't go to 81? Why has that got a red thing on it? 81. Oh, that was her. That's we just went to her. Just went to her house. Okay. Got to remember to do all this. 24 Northwest. Okay. We're going to the forest. We're going to see if there's anything fishy going on here. Illegal flowers or something. As soon as we mention the train family to the middle-aged lady behind the counter, her eyes show the glimmer of recognition. She used to come here regularly, sometimes Mrs. Train and often her maid, Mrs. Carth, to buy flowers for the house. That was over a year ago. She pauses in thought. And if I remember right, Miss Train has been back a few times in the last couple of months, buying flowers again. Chrysanthemums, I think. Thank you, says Wiggins. That's most helpful. Holy F. That damn mother is keeping her son sick. It's Munchausen by proxy in the 1880s style with chrysanthemums. So 24W, and we, we mark that, right? Okay. And this is mother buying chrysanthemum, which she knows is causing her son to get sick. Now, it would be nice to go confront her with this information, but... That's not how this game works. You don't do that. Um, wow. Okay, so the mother... I still can't believe that. Mrs. Train has been back a few times in the past couple of months buying flowers again. So she buying flowers just to make the sun... It's clear the flowers aren't She's not buying drugs from the forest. This forest is an up-and-up up woman. This is actually not bad. It tastes a, tastes a little bit like an egg cream. It tastes like chocolate milk and seltzer. Egg cream is better. It's a little sweet, but it tastes like an egg cream with some coffee. All right, we've got nothing on the board to track down. She's making her son sick. No reason that would tie into the kidnapping, though. Totally separate things. It's like our woman, Sturton, stumbled into this import-export business, this criminal import-export. But why did they pick her up? 
Like, it's not like she stumbled onto something, so they captured her there, because she was picked up here and then kept for a day. So, I mean, this is a long shot. This is kind of crazy, but she's got a schedule, right? Every morning she walks through that park. Is it possible that they're just like, the big shipment is coming this day at this time, in the, tomorrow morning? So they just had to get her off the streets for 24 hours? So she wouldn't do her normal walk through the park? Could it really be that simple? Like this woman is, a, is ignoring everyone telling her to stop walking through the park. But she's there so regularly every morning that they just want her off the streets for 24 hours for some big delivery. Let's look at our schedule again that we found. Remember that delivery schedule? The 24 October, 25 October, 1st November, 3rd November, like a week apart. A week apart would be the 10th. I mean, but she's working there for months, right? I mean, there's, they've been getting deliveries while she's there already. So why is this day any different? I've been governess to them for over a year. No. So, like, why on that day would they have to kidnap her? And then they just make it look like a kidnapping? Okay, well, this is interesting. We're at sort of a different uh, phase of the investigation now because we've investigated all of the areas, unless we've, which we very well could have overlooked something. But let's just mark off the ones we, if we see, look for any that we might have missed. We went to expensive cigar shop. We talked to the constables. The Pickwicks. We talked to the chemist. We talked to the cigar shop. The matriarch. We tried to talk to the uncle. Okay, so I think we have taken care of all the clues that we know about, and now it's time to talk to some informants and see if we can't get some extra information and get a new lead here. So let's take a look at our informants. I'm not sure the best way to do this, but I'm curious to try the top down. So we've got some basic informants we can go to. We can always go to Sherlock Holmes. That's like a hint. The central carriage stables are for cab drivers and carts. So he might know a little bit about the cart that was used. But I'm thinking there's not much to learn there. I think it's these two working in this place that kidnapped her. But... Um, I'm a little bit curious about, oh wait, there's a whole suicide in the park.
Let's take a look at that for a second. I mean, I was gonna say like, this is no big deal, this case, the kidnapping wasn't real. Then I remembered that we've got a suicide in the park. Dead body of a man. Suicides are not that uncommon. Broad daylight on Wednesday. I mean, it was the day of her kidnapping. So, yeah, we actually do have a possible murder involved in this case. So the suicide, suicide with the man cut whose cut was, was on Wednesday, right? And this woman's thing is all 16 November, Wednesday, Thursday. So, so Wednesday is the 18th, 18th, and her stuff happened on the 16th. She was kidnapped on the 16th. And then the mur the suicide was the 18th. So I'm just trying to 16th, which is Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday. So she's kidnapped on Monday. She's let go on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, someone's killed. So it's not like someone was killed and the kidnappers panicked and were like, take her back. Um, so maybe the suicide's unrelated. And I say suicide in quotes because it's probably a murder. But um, so I think we've got a couple places that are very intriguing to go. We've got autopsy, maybe to find out about that body. We've got the criminologist who can analyze some substances found since we did find cigar and some other stuff. And I'm curious to check out the foreign affairs. Where's our foreign affairs person? National Archives to see if they know anything about this drug trade. And maybe um, the underworld person might know something. Yeah, so I mean, and then official police reports we definitely want to look into. So what do you feel like doing first? So looking into the dead body, police reports, and autopsy? Or um, looking into the National Archives about the... the 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 illegal import export okay no one's been commenting for hours we're either disconnected and i don't know it or um everyone's asleep by now it's almost 4 a.m i really should have a better way to tell whether the chat is whether the stream is still going but i'm gonna assume it is all right let's look about let's look into the dead bodies because i'm awfully curious about that dead body so Let's see, should we use a different, what color could we use? Huh? I guess we still use these. Okay, so medical examiner is 38 EC. Let's see what they have to say. And then let's go to the police station, which is 13 SW. And then the news reporter could have some information about the body too. I mean, this is, again, this is sort of like we're just going down every lead, but that's that's what you're here for. You're here to um, have, have the flavor of this game, not to try to solve it as quickly as possible. Where is the fun in that? Okay, let's look at these three. So first we'll go to um, the autop, the medical examiner at 38 EC. Okay, uh, he works at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, 38 EC. Okay. 
I have known Jasper for some years through my medical work, says Watson, as we enter the morgue of St. Bart's Hospital. He is an excellent pathologist, and I introduced Holmes to him in 84 when he was working on a curious case involving the murder of a Ukrainian acrobat. Since then, Sherlock has often called on Jasper when investigating any suspicious deaths. Sir Jasper Meeks is a tall, thin man who appears to be in his late 60s. He has short, tidy gray hair, half-moon spectacles, and a calm, steady demeanor. John Watson, he says, a pleasure to meet you. How is Mr. Holmes? He is well, Jasper, although busy. I have found it hard to keep track of his movements of late. These are the Baker Street Irregulars, Holmes' trusted associates, and we are investigating a case on his behalf. Ah, oh, well, I am happy to help, to give help to you if I can. Thank you. We are investigating the kidnapping of Wendy Sturton and wondered if you could tell us anything about that or about the strange deaths in Hyde Park. I am not aware of any corpses connected to the Sturton kidnapping or that of Mary Dunsworthy, Meeks replies. Sadly, there are sometimes suicides in Hyde Park. I have conducted autopsies for all such cases and do not recall any where there was reason to doubt the individual had taken their own life. I think people in that unfortunate state of mind choose the park because it is one of the few places in London where one can be isolated and unobserved. Very well, Jasper, thank you. Jasper smiles and nods and we doff our caps before exiting the hospital. So he's convinced it's a real suicide. That just seems crazy to me. Who commits suicide by sitting on a bench, stabbing themselves, and then running over to the to the river? Ugh, I don't buy it. All right. Let's make a note that we went to this so that when we get our terrible score, it's all on the up and up. Um, okay, let's go to the police report. 13 SW at New Scotland Yard. So I'll put this same that's where we're going. 13 SW. Okay, it's a long one. Inspector Westrad is a lean, ferret like man whom we have heard Holmes describe as energetic and tenacious but lacking in imagination. When we arrive, he is busy reading papers on his desk and does not see us until we are practically standing over him. Oh, good grief, he says, noticing our presence. Dr. Watson, and you've brought some children with you. Baker Street Irregulars. This is Inspector Lestrade, says Watson. Lestrade, these are the Irregulars, and their leader, Mr. Wiggins. Very good, says Lestrade, but what are you doing all, what are you all doing at my desk? We know Holmes has helped you in the past, Inspector, says Wiggins, and I'm, I'm sure you've helped him too. We thought you might be able to help us. We're looking into kidnapping of Wendy Sturton. She thinks you're investigating into the case may have, well, showed a little, slowed a little. Lestrade guffaws. <laughs> well, she is back safe and sound, is she not? Oh, yes, Inspector, replies Wiggins, but the kidnappers didn't get their money, and she's worried they may come back. Lestrade shakes his head. The thing is, Wiggins... My lad, kidnapping is a specialized crime and a difficult one to pull off. The capture and release can be relatively straightforward, but it's getting the payment that's the hard part. You need to have judged how much to ask for, and then you need a means of collection that is planned so it won't lead the police or anyone else to your door. The first time with Mary Dunsworthy, these kidnappers got their money. Foolishly, Lady Dunsbury did not come to us until after she paid the ransom. The second time, with Wendy Sturton, they weren't so lucky. And they realized they'd picked a bad target, I reckon. It will have given them a fright. And that'll be the last kidnapping they undertake. You mark my words. Did you have any more leads you could share with us? I've sent an officer to see if our informants know anything, but I doubt they will. Mr. Murray has the notes and other items, of course. Now, I do have to get on with more important matters. Thank you, Inspector, says Wiggins, doffing his cap. Tour, a pleasure to meet you, and I'm sure we will meet again. 
Wiggins grins, but from Westrad's expression, we infer that he does not share our reader's enthusiasm. So Mr. Murray has the notes. Mr. Murray is the criminologist, which we will infer. We, we guess that he was, he was involved with the police. So we're like making our rounds in all the official places. So we went to 13 Northwest. Inspector. And he said he's passed all the notes to the criminologist. And what was 38 EC? This was the autopsy. Nothing interesting. Okay, let's go to 22 Northwest and see what the criminologist has to say. The criminologist is H.R. Murray, analyzes all items and substances found during the investigations. Okay, okay here's a long one. I have met this Mr. Murray once before, says Watson, as we arrive at the criminology laboratory, an insightful fellow, if a little eccentric. We enter the laboratory to find an old man hunched over a desk, studying a bowler hat and a dead pigeon with a magnifying glass. He looks up as we approach and peers, peers at us through wisps of unkempt white hair. I know you, he says, pointing at Watson, a medical man and a friend of Mr. Holmes. You are correct, Mr. Murray. I am Dr. Watson, and these are some of some other friends of Dr. Holmes who go by the name of the Baker Street Irregulars. Murray studies us intently. What a fascinating collection of misfits, he says. Thank you, Mr. Murray, says Wiggins, deciding to take the comment as a compliment. I'm Wiggins, and we're here to see if you can tell us anything about these kidnappers. Ah, says Murray, I see interesting stuff, Wiggins. It's Wiggins, sir. What? Oh, well, firstly, we have the notes, which you can see right here. Here's the note, which you guys can see right here. It says, we have Mrs. Certain. We have 2,000 pounds in a sack on the north bank under the new Putney Bridge at dawn tomorrow, and she will be returned to you unharried. And there's another note. We have Mary. We've 2,000 pounds in a sack under the first arch of Richmond Bridge at dawn on 1st September, and she will be returned unharmed. So these are the two notes. This one is from the other kidnapping that we read about in the newspaper that the police think are related, and you can see now why. Our intuition was that they weren't related. He says it's the Dun Dunworthy gang kidnapping. But look, wow, that is, um, they're not on the same paper, but look how the wording is so similar. But now the question is like, either the wording and the, the writing, the the writing is different, so let's, we're going to look at that in a second, but let's, let's, let's stop and pause for a second and think about the theory here. The notes are almost identical, right? So we've got two real options. Option A, same kidnappers. That's the surface level thing. Option B is these people saw this note if it was published in a paper. It was two months before this. If they saw it in a paper, then they're trying to make it look like a similar kidnapping. Now, let's look a little more closely at this. I want you to look at a couple letters because they're both, both handwritten. And I want you to note, if you look at these two, if you can see, like I looked at the Y and the G and in the top note, they're hooked, but don't cross. And in the bottom note, well, 
I guess the bottom note's script. You don't even have to go that deep. The top note is printed. All the letters are separate. The bottom note is scripted, so they're all connected. So clearly written by different people, which makes me think it's copycat kidnapping, which makes me think the kidnappers are again trying to make it look like a kidnapping or trying to make it look like a ransom. They're asking for the same money. Putney Bridge at dawn. I don't even know where the Putney Bridge is, but it seems like they don't even care. Okay. So here we are back to this continuing thing. Both on coarse parchment paper, Murray continues. Then we have two similar red scars, though this one from the first kidnapping is cotton, and the one from the certain kidnapping is a mixture of cotton and silk. And we have the rope used in each case to tie the hands of the victim behind her back. Again, there are differences. In particular, they differ in thickness. And also, look at the ends. He holds two pieces of rope in front of us. One is more frayed than the other. No, oh, one is more frayed than the other, remarks Wiggins. Good eye, Wiggins. There could be other causes for that, but it is likely that the instrument used to cut the rope was different in each case. What does Inspector Lestrade think of this? asks Watson. He thinks a scarf is a scarf, replies Murray, and a rope is a rope, and he may be right. I would be very surprised if the evidence from the two crimes by the same perpetrator were ever to match precisely. Hmm. Anything else? Ah, yes, one more thing. Some bright young officer stationed at the train's house sought to take a sample of mud from Miss Sturton's shoes when she returned after being freed. I, I can't remember his name, but he, he must have learned something from you, Mr. Holmes. I know Holmes takes an interest in exactly these kinds of details, so I sent a description of the chemical composition of the soil onto him. Lestrade was not interested. Do you have a circled C? We do, that's the cigar. That's our circled C. If you do, read on. How curious that it is only partially smoked, says Murray when we show him the cigar. And this looks like an expensive brand. A tobacconist would be able to tell you more. All right, so basically Lestrade, the inspector's a, buff a buffoon. So we're discarding anything he says. And um, Murray thinks there's lots of differences in these two crimes, which we do as well. He collected soil and sent it to Sherlock Holmes to analyze. I mean, we think it's going to lead back to this house, the soil, right? It could be the could be the things but let's this is a good time to put our marker on Sherlock Holmes we're definitely going to visit him now Sherlock Holmes was at um, 42 Northwest 22 one Baker Street 221 B okay and now we went to 22 which was the criminologist that old guy who kept calling him Wagons <laughs> instead of Wiggins. Um, so the, the papers, there was the scarves. Were the scarves like found at the crime scene? Is that what we're uh, led to believe? Like, let's look at this again about um, the other kidnapping. Um, The details of her capture and release. She was left on the city street. Have led police to suspect that the gang response were the same that carried out the Dunsworthy kidnappings. I forget where we learned more about Dunsworthy kidnappings, but I'd like to see if the newspaper person can tell us whether the Dunsworthy kidnappings were publicized. But it sure seems like a kidnap. Uh, a copycat copycat so they weren't really after 
They weren't if they weren't after money. They certainly weren't after threatening to harm her for blackmail because she's the governess. These this rich family's not going to pay to release the governess. All right, let's go visit Sherlock Holmes himself. Forty two Northwest. So we put our marker. This case is going on longer than I suspected it would. I thought it was going to be a quicker case. Forty two Northwest. As we approach the door of two two one B Baker Street, it is thrust open and Holmes comes running out and stops a few feet from us. Ah Waggons, Watson, he exclaims. Sorry I could not meet our client. I was detained elsewhere. We have started the investigation, Mr. Holmes, and we Holmes cuts off Wiggins. Excellent. Pray continue and let me know what you find. Determine whether the kidnapping was carried out by the gang who took Mary Dunsworthy. If not, who knew enough details to emulate it? I don't believe the press reported many facts. That's what we were wondering. Also, consider Miss Sturton's habits and routine. Why was she taken and not some other governess? Now I must leave you. My quarry is on the move. He runs past and down, and down the street to hail a cab, but then stops and shouts back, Oh, of course, Murray, the mud. It was relatively uncontaminated by markers of human activity, clearly from somewhere less traversed than our well-trammeled streets. Do you have circled C, F, J, T, and or Z? We do have some of those. If so, you have time to ask Holmes more questions. Read the relevant entries below for each letter you have circled. You can always come back when you have more letters. Okay, so we can ask him about the stuff we found, our circled letters. So let's see what he has to say about some of these things. We, we show him the cigar. Fascinating. What are all the reasons one might only partially smoke a cigar? You say you saw footprints, but no deep toe prints, as one makes when running. So the person did not stop smoking the cigar because they were surprised, and they, and they had another reason. The smoker must only have had a brief taste of it. Hmm. That's interesting. So he wasn't expecting anyone and got surprised and quickly threw out his cigar. All right, that was a good observation by Holmes. Do we have F circled? Yes. So, Sir Colin Pickwick had just ordered a review of all the park buildings. Interesting. And there seemed to be many of these small green boxes and regular references to the West Indies. So, the rest of the stuff we sort of knew, but he does remind us that these buildings were going to be reviewed. The buildings were going to be reviewed, which the import-exporter people would not want to have happened. They're going to lose the use of all their buildings, if that's true. Hmm. Okay. Uh, we might want to go read, we might want to go reread, sorry, let's make a note that we're at 42 Northwest now. Um, we might want to go read again what Pickwick said about how he was ordering the review to see if somehow this kidnapping might, like would a kidnapping distract the police into not conducting this review? Seems unlikely. Okay. Um, we have J. Allende. Where have I seen that name? And note the specific deliveries this Grace Allende always signs for. So yeah, that's the, that's the, the daughter. Okay. Do we have T? We don't have T, so we don't get to read that. And we don't have Z, so we don't get to read that. So we want to remember that if we find... T or Z come back to Holmes. Like that's important. There's a T and a Z somewhere floating around that we haven't stumbled onto yet. All right, let's put a double green here to remind us to come back. Or green on top of pink. 
Hmm. Let's go to the newspaper and find out what information was. Might have been revealed about that previous kidnapping. So 30 EC. This would be a good time for someone who's been listening in the chat to come up with some ideas here. 30 EC. Thirty E C. Okay, we're at the newspaper office. Henry Ellis is a middle-aged man with a square jaw and very short, well-kept beard. So you work for Sherlock, he says, looking at us over a pair of spectacles. He has given me some excellent material in the past, and I'm always glad to assist in his inquiries. We are investigating the kidnapping of Miss Sturton, says Wiggins. I wrote on both that and the Dunsbury kidnapping, Ellis tells us. The main details in each case were that the victim was taken into a carriage against her will, held by the kidnappers for a week in one case and a day in the other, and then they were released and tied and blindfolded on a city street. The detectives in charge were not willing to release any more information to the press. If you want more details than that, you'll have to go and try your luck with the officials. Okay. So, he's saying the details weren't released to the press. So if it's a copycat kidnapping, it's not because they read the information in the press. But, we do know someone who's involved with this group who's connected with the police, who might know the details, right? That's that constable. So I think it's my money is on copycat kidnapping, the police of constable who's involved in the in this illegal stuff gave them the details or used the details or he's He's the one who wrote the fake note. Um, but then he obviously did know about the kidnapping. And he was... He finished his shift in time to leave the note. So it still doesn't tell us why she was kidnapped. All right, so we went to the Times. All right. We just need one little bridge to connect these things or one little leap of faith figuring out. No, Sherlock Holmes said, like, why her? Figure out why her. We may have to go back and look at her schedule again. She walks through the park constantly in the morning. She walks through the park constantly in the morning. Let's close this up so we're not tempted. They didn't kill her, so it's not like it's not like she saw something that they didn't want her to tell anyone about. I want to go look at what Pickwick says about his review of the buildings. Um... 58 Southwest, is that? Was that it? 58 Southwest. Okay, he's Colin Pickwick. Uh, son and daughter manage it. I liaised with the Metropolitan Police about the repositioning of the park stations. Now I'm considering more such changes. I ordered a census and review of all the buildings in the park, which has just begun and will be complete by Christmas. All of the buildings, including the old gunpowder magazine, yes, that is due to be assessed tomorrow.
the gunpowder magazine where they're keeping all the tobacco is due to be assessed tomorrow. Okay, so this does possibly, I, mean, I can't tell how much of a stretch it is. I like to hear some comments about this. But one of our theories was maybe they just kidnapped her to get her off the street to stop her from doing her normal walk in the park the next morning, right? They only kept her for 24 hours. She always walks the park in the morning, but and no one else does, right? She, she's like alone walking the place. Alone. So he, there's a theory for why they needed to kidnap her that day and only for 24 hours is that the, the gunpowder magazine where they're storing all their stuff and it's filled with stuff, maybe, um, is scheduled to be assessed. So they have to get everything out of there. They have to get everything out of there today. Right? By today or tomorrow. So perhaps they had scheduled a huge pickup where they were going to move it all. And so they just needed to kidnap her for 24 hours just to keep her from walking through the park on her morning stroll so that they could move all the stuff. Seems a bit of a stretch though. Like, couldn't you just move it at night or something? Wouldn't that be easier than moving it in the morning? But it is possible, right? I'd love to hear a comment about whether people think that's a, too big of a stretch. <clears throat> but it would make sense that they just had to get her off the streets for a day. I'm liking that as a general theory, like why her? Because they had to get off the street. But what was the surprise? Remember, like it said, the cigar was being smoked but he must have put it out quickly. We'll, we may have to. In fact, let's go. Let's go read. Let's go read that quote again. Um, where the cigar is. So it's at the gunpowder magazine. Um, it's abandoned. Yet we see tracks in and out. Yeah. Look at. Listen to this. <clears throat> there are many shallow wheel tracks coming from the west. That's where they're probably moving stuff into the nursery or back. It looks like a small cart has made regular trips here over the past few months. Okay, occasionally they're moving, making regular trips. But then look, over here are men's footprints and a set of more recent wheel marks, wide and deep. So a big, giant shipment. A large wagon came to the door, turned, and went back the same way. He picks something from the ground near the door of the magazine. It looks like an expensive grand. It's almost complete, but the end is charred. It was lit and briefly smoked. And it was laying in the dirt for a few days. In other words, someone came and emptied out this place while our person was being kidnapped, possibly with a big, heavy wagon. But why was the person smoking a cigar had to put it out? Because he was smoking, waiting for the delivery truck to come. Delivery truck came, so he quickly threw it out. Or was he surprised by something? What about the person killed? Like, could it? I'm still suspicious of that person being killed, but we didn't, we seem to go nowhere with that. All right, 30 EC, I've written down that we went there, but not what it was. Thirty EC was going to be one of our informants, right? 
30 EC was uh, Times. That was the newspaper. He said the information wasn't leaked to the press, so we think the cop got it. So, <clears throat> I'd like to go now. I mean, we're just chasing down every lead. We could, like, if you were trying to get some good score, you might say, let's take a shot. Let's try to guess the solution and turn to the solution. But I don't see any reason for us to rush that. We've been playing for, I guess, almost five hours now. Um, let's, I want to talk to the National Archive to find out if they have any information about this smuggling of tobacco, 17 WC. And then we can go to the library for encyclopedic research. We might do that just for the hell of it. But I want to go to the National Archives, 17 WC. Is that what I just put? Yes. Um, I want to go to the carriage stables to see if they know anything about a transport a large transport or something. That's 5WC. Okay, let's start at the National uh, Archive for 17 Somerset House. 17WC. Kenneth Duncan Train. National Archives, all archives, uh, oh, this is a national, Archive. all archives, births, deaths, marriages with wills, land records, and criminal records. Okay, that's not quite what I thought we were going to, but, um, okay, it's just records. All right, Kenneth Duncan Trains, born in Leeds on 4 February 1843 to Duncan Archibald Train and Sally Margaret Train near Yale, married Letitia Weiss on 10 July 1875, two children, Duncan Matthew Train, born 8th September 1879, and Clarence Il Ilias Train, born 2nd August 1881. Lativa Weiss, this is the, the opium addicted wife, born in London on 23 May 1852 to Ivan Domino Weiss and Ava Carmen Weiss near Geiger. Wendy Sarah Sturton, this is our governess, Born in Buxton on 3rd December 1844 to Mark Piper Sturton and Gertrude Julia Sturton, now foreman or near foreman. Mary Ella Dunsworthy, this is the kidnap, other kidnap that was returned. Born in London on 25 August 1862 to Ward Augustus Clark Dunsworthy, died 10 September 1882, and Lady Rosanna Anias Dunsworthy near Ryer. And then it asks if we have circled F. Now note, the previous kidnapping was a lord's daughter. Makes much more sense, right? Than kidnapping a governess. So do we have F circled? We do have F circled. So we can read this. Grace Pickwick, born 10 January 1863, married Eduardo Allende. That's her uh, maiden her husband's name, that's why she's signing at Gracie Ende, on 30th October, 1883. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just basically confirming stuff we know. Let's write down that we went to 17WC. Um, not really anything interesting there, right? Just more confirmation about um, about Grace being the one signing for that stuff. I thought there was a foreign intelligence place we could go, though. The Library Underworld Times, police, well, we're, I guess we're going all of these. We're, we're, we're almost done with them all, so we might as well. Let's go to 5WC and find out if there's any carriages information. 5WC. Yeah. 5WC is not... 
available for this case, okay? So we write down no 5WC, 5WC, no clue. So I don't know that we get penalized for that. All right. Um, let's talk to 52EC, the barman. the one who's jacked into all the criminal world. Now, we're, I'm guessing, I'm hoping he's going to clue us in. He's going to give us a clue. I don't think we need it, but I'm guessing he's going to, if I had to guess, he would give us a clue that tell us they're different kidnappers. Um, so 52, this is Porky Shinwell, owner of the Raven and Rat Pub. Sorry, it's not there. It's at 52. EC. East Central. And let me make sure. Yeah, we got 52 EC. Let's look like a thing that shows we're going to Porky's. Fifty two EC. We have all known Porky Shinwell, landlord of the Raven and Rat Public House, for some time. He is a huge coarse man, known for his cunning criminal mind and the time he spent in Parkhurst Prison. <coughs> With a reputation for being something of a brute. So when Holmes first told us Porky was one of his informants and asked us to visit him to gather some details for a case, we were understandably nervous. However, if Porky still has a wicked side to his character, we have been lucky enough to never see it. And to us, he has always been jovial and welcoming. No, mates. Sorry. I don't know anything about these kidnappings. He replies in response to our questions. Although, if it interests you, I have heard some interesting rumors of something going down recently. Mr. Holmes himself was in earlier, asking if I knew about any deals that had happened in the last few days. I told him one of my regulars, Toothy Ted, said he was approached last week to do a big deal of some kind. That's what Ted does, you see. He deals in stuff. Anything that hasn't come by the uh, regular channels. He sat in here smoking cigars with some posh-looking gent for a while, talking it over. He didn't do the deal, though. I don't know why. Any idea where we could find him, Porky? asked Wiggins. No, sorry, mate. Although, if I remember right, I think he used to work near Southwark Bridge. Well, with a name like Toothy Ted, laughs Tinker, I guess we need to look for a guy with a lot of teeth. What? No. Porky frowns. Well, yeah, but not his own. He got the name because he used to be a dentist. He even invented his own toothpaste and got it into the chemist. I'm not sure anywhere stocks it anymore, mind. Not since people found out what he was putting in it. Circle the letter T. Well, that's interesting. So, I mean, that was our That was Porky at 52 EC, which is there. Okay, so that was some interesting clues he gave us. Boy, my, my throat's starting to hurt. <laughs> I may have to stop with the voices. Um, so he told us about Toothy Ted, who's at Porky's. Toothy Toothy Ted, who's a dentist, right? And it's a, definitely a new information. He, circle T. It sounds like cocaine in the toothpaste, something like that. And he got it into chemists. I'm not sure anywhere stock, stocks it. And he gave more information, right? He said, 
There was a deal last week. A big deal. And he was talking to our people. Right? Posh gent for a while, talking it over. So the posh gent is not going to be the detective, but it could be the kids. One of the kids, I think. Were, were those kids described as posh? We're going to have to relook at that in a second. Um, because I want to make sure it's the, the son. Were we told information about the hus train husband smoking? No, I can't remember. I don't think he was smoking a cigar, though. Maybe a cigarette. Uh, Southwark Bridge is where Toothy Ted were, was near Southwark Bridge. Now, was Ted the other person living in that house, remember? Um, no, that was Thomas Pleasant. Okay. So, I'd like to find this toothy tentus. Now, um, we were told to go back to Sherlock Holmes about if we get fine tea. So let's do that. Let's go back and look at 42 Northwest and find out about that toothy Ted thing. And see what Sherlock Holmes says for us. Okay, so we knock, knock, knock. Sherlock Holmes rushes out. If Toothy, Ted, if Toothy Ted sold his products to chemists, a chemist may be able to tell you where to find him. Okay, fair enough. We were going to do that anyway. We didn't need Sherlock Holmes to give us that information. But where is Southwark Bridge? Because there are a bunch of chemists, right? It's going to be a bridge. Blackthorn, Waterloo. Westminster, Lambeth, Vauxhall, Southwark Bridge. Okay, so here's our Southwark Bridge. So we're probably looking for a chemist in the EC area. Let's look them up. Chemists, we've got 68 EC, which looks very promising. We've got one in the northwest. We've got one in the east. What do you mean one in the east? I wonder if that's not doesn't is not relevant. Like it's not even on the board. Seventy two northwest, eighty seven southwest, eighty five southeast. So let's mark that one. That's always possible. What was it, Southeast? 85 Southeast. Okay. So that could be a place. WC. I don't know if it was here. I guess it's relevant. So let's look up that one. 66 WC. Sixty-six. And then there's sixty-three, there's sixty-four. Here's sixty-six. So we're gonna say that's too far away. We could always come back if we really run out. Forty-seven QP, Queens Point. I don't think that's on this map. So there are just a couple places that aren't even in this thing. Now, I do notice there are dentists. Let's just mark some dentist locations here. 23 WC, if they're near him. 23 WC is not very near him. Looks like it's... Where is 23 WC? Down there. Let's ignore that one. 
93 Northwest and 64 WC. So that one's pretty near him. So let's check out. We don't need this bridge again. That was just telling us where he was near. And was 68. Yeah, that's the one that seems highly likely. Okay, so let's just right now chemists near Southwark are 68 and then possibly, sorry, 68 EC, but possibly also 85 WC and 64 WC dentist in case we're having trouble finding him. But let's start at 68 EC. Sixty eight EC. Do you have a circled T? Yes, we do have the T circled. If not, you learn nothing. If you do, read on. Hello, friend. It is certainly good to be in the warm again, says Wiggins, as jovially as possible to the stern-faced young gentleman behind the counter at Gould and Son Chemists. Are you suffering from some form of ailment? The man asks. Uh, no, replies Wiggins. I hope not. We're here to ask if you ever stocked toothpaste made by a local dentist, a gentleman by the name of Ted, or perhaps... Theodore or Edward? I think you are suffering from a cold, sir, and should purchase some bottles of Gould's Remedies. He places three large bottles on the counter with price tags that seem rather excessive for a cold medicine. Reluctantly, Wiggins gathers the money and hands it over. I don't know if this is a bribe or information. Thank you, sir. There was a gentleman who practiced dentistry in the area and sold toothpaste, but I believe some aspects of his practice were found to be less than respectable and he was closed down. He wraps our purchases in brown paper and pushes them towards us. His name was Edward Ivory. Well, at least our investigation won't be curtailed by any of us catching cold says Wiggins, as we lugged the bottles from the shop. So this was like our way of, he wanted a legal bribe, so he sold us some overpriced stuff. But we got the name of Edward Ivory. And we went to 68 EC. Let's make a note of that. This is chemist. Okay, so I don't think we need to go to these other uh, dentists and chemists, but let's look up Edward Ivory. Wow, we're at five hours in, so I think it might be time to take another break soon. Ivory Edward, 41 Northwest. I'm trying to remember what the longest YouTube can be. And I don't want to... Um, I don't have a good way to know if it ever kicks off YouTube. So we'll find out, but what if we, we're not going to continue this. We're, we're going to take a guess at it soon. Edward Ivory, 41 Northwest. Okay, let's put a thing there. Let's remove these. All right, we went to 68. That's where we met our guy. And we don't need these anymore. Edward Ivory, 41 Northwest. Huh, he is near the action here. 41 Northwest Edward Ivory, the toothless guy. Look at this illustration here. That's one of us. There are the irregulars. The man peering at us through the crack of the door is clearly suspicious of us. 
Toofy Ted, says Wiggins. We asked at the Raven and Rat about who could help us with some goods. Do a deal, you know, and your name came up. He opens the door wider and we see a tall man in a tight-fitting waistcoat with small, fierce eyes. I don't think you're here for a deal, he says. What do you want? Well, Wiggins thinks for a moment. You see, Mr. Tooth, er, Ted, we heard you were recently approached to do a deal and we'd like to find out more about it. Toothy Ted gives a humorless grin. Porky been chatting with you, has he? Yeah, well, th that is no real secret. A gentleman proposed a deal for some items, he said, hadn't come into the country by the regular channels. But when he said how many he had, it was more than I could handle. So I didn't do it. Also, I didn't like the cut of his jib. He didn't fit in with the usual clientele at the Rat, and I don't think he knew what he was doing. A bit green around the gills, and desperate with no idea how to move the stuff on in bulk. I did suggest someone, as a joke, because I couldn't see this guy dealing with him. Who? says Watson. Ted glances around. It'll cost you. Watson hands over some coins and Ted grins. Have you heard of Professor Moriarty? We shake our heads, but Watson says yes. Well, Ted continues, publicly he is known as a professor of mathematics, but there is a darker side to him the public do not see. I've heard rumors of the power he has over London, Suffice to say, I'd sooner deal a, do a deal with the devil than with Moriarty. And could you describe the man from the Raven and Rat, says Wiggins, and tell us what he was trying to sell? For a brief second, Ted glances at a green wooden box on the hall table. Then he laughs. <laughs> do you think I just came out of Bedlam? If I tell you that, no one will do business with me again. Professor Moriarty, says Watson as we walk off down the street. That's the man I've heard Holmes mention on numerous occasions. If before Holmes was not interested in this case, I think now we will have his attention. Circle the letter Z. So, <clears throat> this leads a little bit of weight to our theory that they had to move this stuff right away. He has desperate to find someone who could move it. I almost think that person who was killed at the dock or killed at the park to make look like a suicide might have been like the driver. Although they didn't kill anyone else. But okay. Well, now you know what happens. We circle Z. And we found info about Moriarty. So <clears throat> the posh guy, he, he says um, he didn't fit in, green around the gills, and desperate. So I, I, I don't want to forget to go back to Pickwick and see the description of the sun, make sure he's described as sort of fancy and pompous and stuff. Um, but before we do, don't let me forget, before we do, let's uh, go back to Sherlock Holmes and ask him about Moriarty and see how he reacts, right? So it was 42 Northwest because that was the last thing. We've now asked Sherlock Holmes about everything that he's willing to tell us about. Okay, so knock, knock, knock. Sherlock Holmes is a Russia. What is it? What is, what is it? Um, we just heard some guy mention Moriarty might be involved in this case. Here's Sherlock Holmes. I think you will not obtain more information today about Professor Moriarty. However, I do have a note written by one of Moriarty's men, which I now see may be relevant to your case. Don't ask me how I acquired it. And we've got a note here. It's written in script, cursive. My employee, my employer has told me, so this is a note by one of Mourinier's men. My employer has told me to inform you that collection will take place on Tuesday, November 17th at 8 a.m. 
There it is. Look at that. The day after her kidnapping in the morning. My employer has told me to inform you that collection will take place on Tuesday, November 17th at 8 a.m. The address that this is the only choice you will be given. The, he advises, sorry, he advised that this is the only choice you will be given. Uh, ensure this business is conducted efficiently and discreetly. So that was a very circuitous way to get this little confirmation note that he did make the deal with Moriarty's people. Moriarty's people left a note. They said it's happening Tuesday at 8 a.m. That's your only choice. You're in a rush. Be there. We're doing it. Then these guys panic. They realize the woman walks through that park every day from 7 to 8 around that time, right? Her schedule is like clockwork. She's right where they need to be able to get in. They talk to the cop who's part of their operation. He's like, all right, I know what we're going to do. We're going to make it look like this kidnapping that I know all the details of. Here's how we're going to write the note. A kidnapper, we just bring her to this house for a day. We leave a ransom note, release her the next day. Everyone will just think she was kidnapped. Meanwhile, she'll be out of the way. I wonder if we, um, if we go back to... Uh, listen to her describe being kidnapped if she heard the wagons and stuff um, so the fire the next morning uh, eventually when I took to the next day I heard movement and whispering the man then a man said loudly you're not going to pay what they're not going to pay let's release her taken back into the carriage so yeah they finished moving the stuff they let her go yeah, so I think we got it pretty well figured out. Let's um, go back to the Pickwicks. Let's make sure that the son is the the dandy fellow that we think met with the, at the bar that was out of place. That was um, 58 Southwest. Okay, so the guy, the rich guy who orders the houses be, re, the park be reassessed. Obviously, he's not involved in it. He wouldn't have called for that. But he calls his son and Grace down. Okay. A young man and woman enter. Like his father, Patrick Pickwick exudes excess energy, rubbing his hands as his eyes move across each of us in turn. Um... Patrick opens the green box, so he's smoking, so obviously he's involved in that. Really, Patrick, I was abroad when husband owned plantations, so she like travels. She probably arranged these deals with her husband, who's probably involved in this illegal stuff. Um, she's in the West Indies, so yeah, she set this stuff up. She returns, her husband dies, she comes back. Um, No description of how he looks, though. Um, he's the sir. He comes back. My son and daughter manage it. All right. Well, no description of how they look. But. exudes excess energy they're taking uh, cocaine or something from the in addition to the tobacco I don't know we didn't nail that down but it it doesn't have to be cocaine it could just be the the escaping the import taxes um, this would be a good time for anyone in the chat who wants us to run down any last leads 
before we try to solve this. What was here at 41 Northwest? Oh, that was Edward Ivory. We got his information. That was super useful, especially with Sherlock Holmes. So what do we think? The guy was probably uh, smoking a cigar and then the people arrived and he quickly put it out. Like he wasn't surprised, but like they were in a rush to get it done quickly. Uh, so we went 68 EC, then we went 41 Northwest. So it feels like we're just about um, ready to try to solve this. The only thing I don't, I don't, like there's this interesting thing. If we knew this case continued, then maybe we'd think that dead body would get resolved elsewhere. But I would like, it would be nice to, to know about that body before we tried to wrap this up. Like we don't know how he's connected to our case, if he is at all. The autopsy person thinks not, but I think so. Let's read again what it, how it describes the body that was found. Suicide in Hyde Park. On Wednesday, near Stanhope, Stanhope Gate, reports were made that on a seat a little distance away, a man was bleeding. So it's Wednesday, which was the day... The day she was released, kidnapped on the 16th. Monday, Tuesday. What do I have written down on, happened on, oh, the suicide, right, okay. Kidnapped on the 16th, let go on the 17th after the delivery. So 17th is the delivery. Um, or transport out of there. And then on Wednesday, which is the 18th, is the suicide, so the day after. Uh, the man was bleeding from the throat, having caused the injury himself by means of a blade. On arrival at the spot, police could see nothing of the man, but found a trail of blood on a path. This is another game question. These are all, always a little unfortunate. So it says, reports were made a man was bleeding from the throat, having caused the injury himself. This is sort of suggesting that, like people saw, like it is known that he caused it by himself. Um, but do we trust that or do we think someone killed them? But anyway, a uh, dead body taken out of the serpentine, of the water. Suicides have become a frequent occurrence. Drowning in the serpentine is usually the method adopted. Revolver and poison sometimes used. Yeah. So everyone that's involved in this that we know of is alive. The Grace and Patrick are still alive. The constable is still alive. So we are, um, there's no one missing. It's possible that it's someone related to our case, but we have no reason to believe that, even if it was a murder. The dates are highly coincidental. And it's possible it was the driver of the truck, uh, of the cart, um, but we have no clues to that. So we're almost ready to solve it. While we're here, we might as well visit the other things so you can see how these work. Um, and then I think we're ready. So the ones we haven't talked to is, we haven't talked to uh, Langdale Pike, the social columnist, to Southwest. So let's go talk to him before he, we're not in any rush to solve this case. We're kids, we're probably getting paid a shilling a day or something. Or just in food. So let's go to Langdon, Langdale Pike, to Southwest. <clears throat> it's actually kind of long here. I'm not a fan of the man myself, says Watson, as we enter the Society's Club. 
He is a strange, languid creature who makes a living from publishing all manner of scandal. But Holmes will not hear a bad word said about Langdale Pike and finds him invaluable when gossip about the lives of London's upper class is required. It's Dr. Watson, says a pale, effete man reclining on a chaise lounge in a bay window of the club. But no sign of Dr. Holmes. What brings you my way, doctor, with your intriguing companions? Hello, Langdale, says Watson. I'm sure you have heard Holmes refer to the Baker Street Irregulars. Here they are. And we've come to ask you about the Train family. We're investigating the kidnapping of their governess. Left tied and blindfold on a street. Somewhere, wasn't she? Says Langdale. I must admit, I rarely encounter the trains. A family, ordinarily, and highly respectable family, as far as I'm aware. Not my kind of thing at all. And not particularly well off either, unlike Lady Dunsworthy. Now she had a daughter worth kidnapping. Kenneth Train's uncle is Lawrence Yale, a man more to my taste in terms of his contributions to society, gossip, you understand. Yale is a known womanizer and owns racehorses. The wonderful Indian boy has been his real showstopper, and I may add, has made yours truly a bob or two in the past. And what about the other name you mentioned, the Dunsworthies? Yes, victims of the same gang of kidnappers, I believe. Well, Lord Dunsworthy died three years ago and left his wife a fortune. Mary is their only child. Quite a delightful thing, and an out-and-out -out socialite, always on her way to or from some party or another. Though I understand her social activities have decreased since her kidnapping. Thank you, Mr. Pike, says Wiggins. Watson gives a curt nod, and we exit the club. So, all uh, red herring stuff. Is it possible the uncle was involved? No. I don't see any evidence that the uncle was involved. He's got money, but he's making his money from the horses. Okay. That was two. Running out of voices. Uh, okay, what's left? Lomax the Librarian, 5 Southwest. 5 Southwest. We are almost done with this. Guys, if you're in the chat still and you have any other leads you want us to track down that might tell us about the dead person, we could travel to the hospitals. We could do some, uh, some reconnaissance on our own that the hospital or the morgue, although I think this guy at, works at the morgue. Um, okay, here we go to the library. I don't know what we're trying to find at the library. I feel like this is information we don't need, but 5 Southwest. Okay, 5 Southwest isn't even in here. So we didn't need to go there at all. Where's our sheet of places we've gone? Okay, so we went to 2 and then 5 Southwest, no all right so we are basically done if we wanted to know about that guy who died we talked to the carriage stables yeah they weren't in there is that right five at WC I know we tried to go to the carriage stables, but I believe they, were, they weren't in there, right? Yeah, they weren't in there. So I think we've gone to all the places, all of our informants. So you got a flavor of them all. They all have different personalities. Um, okay, so if we wanted to take one last shot of worrying that that guy was involved in our case because it happened the day after everything, We might look for, well, let's see. I know this is where, this would be, Greg would be like, this has gone on long enough, but Greg is not here. So I wanna, um, 
look in the park again where the guy went to tell people about the Humane Society. So, Pale Man in Dark Suit, we ask him about Miss Sturton. Uh, she walks in the park, she stops by to talk. She often did not stick to the past and would walk amongst the trees, even in the ice or snow. Okay. But, um, let's... If that body was related to anything, right? Let's take a look. And we went to the medical examiner at 38 EC. So the medical examiner is here. Let's look at our directory again. And I want to see there's a coroner's office. 91 EC, which is different than the medical examiner. So let's just stop in and see if the coroner's office has anything for us. So that was 91 EC. So this is an interesting part about the game where, you know, this wasn't mentioned in any of our clues. But 91 EC, it's probably near the coroner's office, wouldn't you think? Near the medical examiner. 91 EC. Numbers are a little scattered up here in EC. Okay, yeah, it is right next to the hospital. All right, let's see if there's any entry for 91 EC. No, there's no entry for 91 EC. Okay, so we, we didn't find anything. I don't know if we mark it here. EC, no clue. Okay, well, that was the coroner's office. No reason to go to any doctors. There are some docks, though. There's the West India docks. There's the West India docks. What do you think? You want to just check out the West India docks? It's 97. It's 97 east. It's actually not on this map. I don't know exactly how to explain that to you. I can't remember if the other cases had another side that was outside London. But these are just cool places, but not related to us. 97 E, C, yeah. Unless you think there's just E. I don't even see numbers that go up that high. Okay. There's an embassy. Not the the French embassy is near us. Where did they say? Where did the newspaper say the body was? Uh, Stanhope Gate. A dead body taken from the water. Stanhope Gate. I don't see Stanhope. South Carriage Drive. Um, hospitals. But he wouldn't have gone to a hospital, right? He was found dead and pulled out of the water. He goes right to the morgue. So there's no hospital. Jewelers, parks. Well, the tree is where one guy was found hanging. Should we just check out 96 just for the hell of it? 96 Northwest. Let's look at the tree where the body was found just for fun. No. No item for the tree. No clue. Well. Tobacconist, watchmaker, wine merchant. Okay, guys, I think... Well, let's look at the stables. Let's see if someone rented horses or something. 5WC and 61EC. 5WC. We're only going to check out the one that's near us. So there's a stable. And there's 61EC, which is all the way over here. So we're only going to look at this one. Well, 61EC. This guy lived... No, this guy... This, the Pickwicks lived here. Okay, so let's just check, check out this one. 5WC. Make sure there's nothing that we want to find there. We're just, at this point, we're just 
being careful, extra careful. 5 EC, we said, right? No, nothing at 5 EC. All right, guys. I'm going to look in the chat. This is your last chance. Nothing. Okay. Well, we're at 5 hours, 40 minutes. So we're going to take a 5-minute break, and then we will wrap this case up. Here we go.
Okay, we are back. You are watching Co-op for Two. You're watching a live stream that's on hour five, almost hour six. We're playing Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, the Baker Street Irregulars box. Case one, which is the Curzon Street kidnapping. We're about ready to solve it. Right before we solve it, I just wanna uh, mention one last thing I was thinking. Like I'm looking at the comments, we've got no, no one suggesting anything else to do, but there's one little loose, I'm just looking for a, a, any loose ends that we forgot to tie up. Um, the one that, um, the one that's jumping out to me though is that the, the nursery has signatures by two people. One, one is Grace Allende. And we know who she is. But then the other signature is by a C. Nestor, right? So we went to his house, which was 11 EC, which I'm just going to pop up here. The landlady at number 11 tells us she, I know we said we we're going to solve it, but we're, we're not yet solving it. We're very close though. So the room is led to two people, Thomas Pleasant and Clyde Nestor, but neither of them is at home. Do you know where we might find Clyde? Friends of his, we're friends of his. We have some good news to give him. He works as a manager of something at Hyde Park, something to do with plants. So he's the manager of this place, right? But he's not there. I had an old wardrobe and he went off with it about 20 minutes ago, saying he'd seen a way he could make some money for it. Um, and we circled letter A. I don't remember if we ever used A for anything, which uh, is very troubling. Like, did we ever, Holmes didn't ask us about A, right? To Northwest, no. So, um, I'm afraid we've got an issue here. We've got A, we've got this person we've tracked down, Claude Nestor. We know he's still alive, so he's obviously not that body, but we don't know anything more about him or how like is he the guy that met and tried to find someone to pick up stuff why did we think it was the son like we know grace is involved and he lets a room with thomas pleasant we don't know who that is either Hold on a second. Hold on a second. If this is, if this turns out to be right, I'm going to be thrilled with this case. Okay. So 20 minutes ago, I had an old wardrobe I wanted to get rid of. And he went off with it 20 minutes ago saying he had seen he could get some money for it. So you're probably guessing what I'm thinking now, right? Did he take it? to a furniture shop and can we find him there? Let's try it. So that's 11 EC. Let's mark that. Uh, I mean, if, it, if, it's, if it's nothing, that's fine. But if it is true that we can follow this lead down, I'm gonna be thrilled. So that's where we are now. Okay, now let's look up in our directory whether there's any furniture shops. Oh, there's no furniture shops? Oh, I thought there was. Well, there are department stores, booksellers, boarding houses, hotels, embassies, furriers, docks, jewelers, markets. Oh, I thought 
thought there were going to be some furniture shops. <clears throat> well, let's look at um, eleven EC. What did she say about it? She said it's a wardrobe. Wardrobe. Well, oh, I thought for sure that was going to be interesting. Wardrobe. You know, there's auction houses. They're all in Northwest, Southwest, WC. He's not auctioning it. He's it's not. He's not auctioning it at Sotheby's. <laughs> A wardrobe, but let's see. Um, there's some markets. Let's see if there's any in this area. 18 EC is a market. So he's here. So there's a market there. That's Leadenhall Market. I don't know what that is. Oh, these are markets. These are food, not uh, 18 EC. So those are foods. But let's see. Where else would he be going? Markets or food. Surely there's some inland revenue same place, steamship tailors. I really feel like we got to track this guy down a little bit, especially since we never got asked. Sorry guys, I know we said we were going to solve it. And I feel like we're, we'll, we'll know most of this answer and we'll recap it in a second. But <clears throat> There's some department stores here. They're all in Northwest, but there's 61 EC as a department store. Can you sell it at a department store? There's no Craigslist. No, I don't think. Where's 61 EC? The question you have to ask yourself when you play these games is are you the person that wants to solve it in the least amount of time? Or are you the person that would rather spend a day nailing down one tiny little lead that could possibly be related to your case? I don't see 61 EC. Since it's probably not relevant, it's a um, department store. There's actually a couple here. There's 27 EC and 71 EC. See if we can find some of these. 71 EC. There was a 27 EC. I'm sure it would be nice to have a reverse 27. These are all department stores in this area. 27, 71, and the other one was 61. Surely that's new there. I can't find it, but it's not important that we know where it is as long as it's not. I'm just going to put it here and call that 61. Let's just look it up here. 
We'll start with 61. So there's no 61. Okay, we'll just make a note that we went there. We also checked 71. There's no 71. 27. There's no 27. So we just wasted some time there. But where would he get rid of it near there? 83, 18, 17. I wish I could know what these places were. There's detective agencies. Churches, booksellers. Was it a wardrobe of clothing and not a wardrobe wardrobe? Was it her wardrobe? Like I'm assuming it was a, a cabinet, but maybe she was saying it's her clothing. Are we getting stretched? Let's look if there are any clothing stores. Oh, pawnbrokers. I wonder if it's a pawnbroker that he went to. 73 EC. Yeah, 73 EC. Okay, I don't see it, but it's not important. I'm just going to. Oh, there's 73 EC. Let's look up the first 73. See, nope. It's another wasted time. He didn't go to a pawnbroker. Surely that's where he would have gone if he was selling it. Uh, public houses, those are here. Stables, tailors. Tailors where you would have stuff made, right? Not tendency. Just for the hell of it, no. Okay, so I went into, I stopped by the tailors and see if he was trying to, we're really trying to find this guy. Okay, what about the furriers? Where were they? Any furriers in his area? Just on WC, 68 and 64 WC. It's pretty far away. 68 and 74. There's 74. Sorry, I wasn't saying 68 and 64. Double UC. Sixty-eight. It's almost pointless to put these locations because they're probably 68 and 64, okay, 64, was it really 64, the furrier? 64 WC actually has an entry. The name Toothy Ted needs nothing to me, made toothpaste, did he? Well, if you want good toothpaste, you need to buy Jones Bright and White, available from all London chemists, and I think I still have some here. Thank you, Mr. Jones, but we best be on our way. Uh, I don't know why we're asking about toothpaste at the at the dentist at the furrier. Sixty-eight WC is not an entry. Uh, Sixty-eight WC, sixty-four WC. Yeah, okay. That might be a little typo in there. Um, wow. Okay, I really want to find this guy, but I don't know. Like, I feel like. It was a wooden wardrobe. <sighs> Post office, criminal court, cathedral, guild hall, stock exchange, customs house. What about the customs house? I'm just looking on the board now. Customs house. I mean, the customs house might be a nice place to go to just... 
I see two places. Stansfield Market, Spit Spitalfields Market. I'm just looking at places that are listed on the board now. And I don't know what the guild hall is. But I'm trying to find places near where he is that he might I'm going to try going to the customs house because customs is relevant to our case, even if it's not relevant to the wardrobe. So 19 EC. Okay, 19 EC is in here. It asks if we have J, which we do. So we can read this. At customs house, we ask about imports destined for the Hyde Park nursery. Plants. Plants, says a slouching, bored-looking man behind the counter. Plants and flowers. Indeed, replies Wiggins. And have you ever noticed anything unusual about the deliveries? He shakes his head. Well, perhaps you could tell us if there have been any changes in what's delivered or how much of it. The man sits up and flicks through some papers, then sits silent for almost five minutes. Wiggins is just about to speak again when the man suddenly says, Over the past year, more from West Indies. I see. And has anything unusual ever been found when you check the deliveries? Royal Park delivery. Rarely checked. Okay, thank you, sir. So, 19EC was useful. Useless, 8, nothing. Bank, stock exchange. Where would he bring a a wooden wardrobe or is this just chasing down maybe it's chasing down a lead we can't re resolve it pains me though that we can't find him okay I think it's time we're gonna try to solve it and oh we circled a we circled a Thomas Pleasant and Clyde Nestor. Neither of them at home, where we might find Clyde. He was the manager of the thing. There was a way he could get money for it. Was there something else we came across with a wooden box? Okay. Let's try to solve it. <clears throat> so shall we recap the case? First of all, the mother is an opium addict. She's purposely making her son sick so she can get prescribed the Ludanon or whatever it's called, full of opium, and she takes it herself. Totally unrelated to the kidnapping. Just a side, just a side note that the woman needs to get locked up. Our governess has a very regular schedule. Every morning, she walks through the park, no matter how cold, whatever it is, she takes the walk from the house down through the park, does some stuff, that's her break, then she comes back. While she's there, she talks to the people there. She talks to the police officers there. She's friendly with them. She talks to the, to the um, people who work in the plant shop. They all know her. The society knows her. Everything, everyone knows her. So that's her routine. And then she comes home. She makes them lunch, and she goes off on her errands downtown. She gets the drugs for her other errands. Meanwhile hanging out at the house and using this house, this this um, greenhouse and the gunpowder magazine and the, whatever the locked house was, using it for their illegal import-export or just import business of illegal c cigars, possibly other drugs, but definitely cigars, is this group of people, including the bad cop. I forget his name, but it's in our records the two children of the guy who's nominally in charge of Hyde Park. So Grace, the daughter, who's got connections to the West Indies to set up this importing business that's bypassing the import taxation fees. 
and the son who's also involved. They are running this business um, along with the bad cop and along with this person that we're going to get dinged for not having found him and no information about, Nestor, who's signing for some of this stuff. So the father tells the kids, hey, guess what? I've decided to, you know, we're, I'm going to finally do my job around the park. We're going to have all these buildings in the park reassessed and see if we can repurpose them. The, the, the son and the daughter go back. They're like, okay, we're in trouble. Uh, this, these buildings are going to get um, assessed. People are going to be walking here. They're going to find that we're storing this giant warehouse full of cigars in the magazine, gunpowder magazine. We have to get them out as soon as possible. So then they panic. They go on a rush to get the stuff out of there. They go hunting. They connect with this guy, Ted Toothy, who's the underworld guy. Um, he says, they, and they meet, he meets with them. He meets with the son, I guess, we think. The son or the manager at the bar, at the underworld bar. And he says, I'm not going to do this for you. It's too big a job for me moving. There must be a lot of cigars in that warehouse, in that magazine. But I will connect you with Moriarty's people. Moriarty's people get back to him. They say, okay, we're going to move your stuff, but it's going to be on Wednesday, the 17th. It's going to be at 8 a.m. We're going to be there. That's You don't have any options. That's the only time we can do it. Get it done efficiently. So then these guys, the cop, the bad cop, and the two kids panic because the date that the time and date that the pickup's going to come is when our governess always walks through the park. They realize she's going to see what they're doing. So they come up with this scheme. The cop says there was this recent kidnapping. We're just going to kidnap this woman. We'll just keep her in this house for a day, just overnight, till we finish unloading. Then we're going to make it look like a kidnapping. Let her go. Everything's fine. And that's what happened. That's our story. It actually worked. They did the move. It's possible now, related to our case, someone was also killed. It's not the kids and it's not called Nestor the, the um, nursery. So it may be totally unrelated, but it could be one of the other people. We don't know who Thomas Pleasant is and we don't know where Claude Nestor is. Although if he's trying to sell a wardrobe for a couple bucks... I don't know how much involved, I mean, he's obviously involved in this illegal stuff. I don't know why he's trying to get money. That's a little bit of a mystery uh, to us. But we are ready to solve this case and see how much we got right and see how much we missed. So, when we're ready, we're going to read this solution. But what I think we do this first. So, in each booklet is a little envelope with a little card here where we score. Uh, so let's see. I guess when this is the answer is for the score, but we read, we turn to the very back of the book. So don't look at this yet. We turn to the very back of the book, which has the questions for us. So let's see what we've got here. Who kidnapped Wendy Sturton? Okay. Why? What was Constable Ponsford's involvement? What deal was being done? Okay, so we've just gone over those. We think that we know those. The brother and sister, and maybe along with the cop, but the brother and sister were the male and the female, right? Why they wanted to get her off the premises so she wouldn't be walking there in the morning. What was Constable Ponsford's involvement? We think that he was uh, told them about the the ransom note and what to do it and maybe he was watching her and he's involved in the scheme accepting the deliveries or whatever okay that's our main those are our main questions i'm not going to write them down but maybe you would write them down if you wanted to be if you wanted to make sure you didn't wiggle rooms anything okay second series who was the buyer in the deal um so we're thinking it's moriarty's people right do we think that that's the deal Moriarty. What is wrong with Little Duncan Train? 
while little Duncan Train is be has an is having allergic reaction to the chrysanthemums that the mother is bringing in. What is the story behind his illness? Okay, so we think we know that. Okay, so the next page is is the solution from Sherlock Holmes. But before we read that, we look at our answers. Okay, here we go, guys. So there's the answer thing. This was in the envelope. The Curzon Street Kidnapping, Case 1. Last chance. First, who kidnapped? So let's go to our questions. Who kidnapped Wendy Sturton? The answer is Patrick Pickwick and his sister Grace Allende. Okay, 25 questions. We got that right. So let's see. We're going to score us. We're going to lose because of how many things. But Okay, so we got plus 25 for that for question 1. Question two, why? To prevent her from observing them doing an illegal deal at the old gunpowder magazine in Hyde Park. All right, we got that right. Question two, that's another 25 points. Three, what was Constable Ponsford's involvement? He was bribed by Grace and Patrick to ignore the deal which was taking place on his morning shift. Well, they say he was bribed to ignore the deal. We said he was sort of in on it. And I thought he was the one who knew about the ransom note. This is going to be one of these things that we're going to come back to if it doesn't have a better way that they got the information we're going to say. So I'm going to put plus 25 with a little question mark there. Depending if you want to say we knew he was involved. They say bribed. We said he was part of it. So, okay. Question four, what deal was being done? A large stock of illegally imported, possibly stolen, high quality cigars from the West Indies were being sold. So that's another plus 25, that's us. Again, we thought maybe there's other drugs, but no hard evidence about that. So we got all four of the main questions right, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm gonna give us, we're gonna come back to this question about bribing the cop in a second. Okay, here was the second question. Who was the buyer in the deal? These are sort of bonus questions. And the answer is Professor Moriarty. So that's another 20 points for us. Toothy Ted, who gives Moriarty's name, is mentioned by Porky Shinwell. He can be located. Oh, this is telling where we can find. where These bonus questions, it's telling us how we can find them. Because I guess a lot of people maybe miss it. Question six. What is wrong with little Duncan? His mother is using chrysanthemum pollen, plus 10 points to give him an allergic cough, plus 10 points. So we got both of that right. What is the story behind his illness? Mrs. Train had become addicted to landinum since she took it for her own illness some months ago. Plus 10 points, we knew that. Right, we read that. Seeking to hide the fact and protect the reputation of her family, she is now using Duncan's illness as an excuse to get into the house and insists on caring for him herself so that she can secretly consume it. Plus 10 points. Okay. So we actually got 100%. We got every single question right, every single point. So that's 100 points for the main, and then 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 points for the bonus questions. Now... Um, I've put the rule book away. Let's just whip it out and let us see how much we're supposed to penalize ourselves for each location and clue we looked up. So let's look at the score. Okay, so you get your score. Um, total up the number of leads you followed and compare the lead to Holmes. So the leads would be the ones that aren't blank. So when they're blank, you don't get charge for them. So it's something like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. What depending if you count ninety five. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, somewhere around twenty-six leads. Probably more or less, depending on whether you count the 95s. Um, so we're supposed to lose five points for each extra lead beyond Sherlock Holmes. So it's gonna, he's going to solve it in like five. We're going to lose all our points. Here we go. We're going to read Sherlock Holmes' solution to this case. He's going to fill in some missing details. Then we're going to decide. We're going to have some comments. 
I'm just gonna read it in my normal voice because my voice is starting to hurt. <laughs> Doing the scratchy voices hurts. An interesting puzzle, says Holmes, as he paces by the fireside at 221B Baker Street, which, alas, has not quite the ending I sought. He turns to us and no doubt registers the confusion on our faces. When we began the case, says Watson, I was suspicious of Mrs. Train. Indeed, replies Holmes, but as I'm sure you realize, Watson, for Miss Train to be Mrs. Train to be involved, she would have to be associated with an expert gang of kidnappers who had taken Mary Dunworthy or have managed to emulate the Dunsworthy kidnapping, despite many details not being reported in the press. Well, we had already ruled her out, but that's a good good reason why she couldn't have been that. No, the obvious starting point for the case was the Dunworthy kidnapping. It was crucial to find out if Miss Sturton was taken by the same gang and a visit to H.R. Murray and Lady Dunsworthy indicated she was not. There were not only discrepancies in the materials used in each kidnapping. I'm not sure we talked to Mrs. Dunworthy. I mean, I know we, I know we tried to track her down to talk to her about it. Maybe we did talk to her about it. But anyway, we had already decided it wasn't related. Uh, there were not only discrepancies in the materials used in each kidnapping, but the modus operandi was very different. In one case, we have the well-planned and efficient kidnapping of a wealthy woman's daughter. In the other, we have the governess of a family with a modest income thrust into a carriage from the street. In the first case, the kidnappers asked for an appropriate sum of money and gave the family almost a week to find it. In the second case, they asked for a sum of money well beyond the means of the family and demanded it the following dawn. It is also of note that the sum demanded in each case was 2,000 pounds which suggests that someone wanted the kidnappings to appear similar. This was our theory as well. And the details in the press would not have been enough to imitate the kidnappings, as neither the color nor the scarf nor the wording of the note were mentioned. So the perpetrator must be someone who knew the details by other means. At this point, one can conclude that the most likely culprit is someone connected with Mary Dunsworthy herself. We got that. We didn't know that because I don't think we... I don't think we tracked down Mary Dunsbury. I think we left that lead unfollowed. Wiggins leans forward. Lady Rosanna Dunsworthy and Mary's friends had persistently asked her about her, asked her about the kidnapping, he exclaims. Holmes smiles. And now the investigation shifts from the Dunworthies to Miss Sturton. Her acquaintances, her work, her habits. It is to a person idiosyncrasies that we must look when inquiring into a case. So I think we got it wrong thinking that the cop knew the details. I think it was the mother who knew the details and Mary's friends asked about the kidnapping. Okay. I wonder if Mary was friends of this, the brother and sister and that's how they found out. Okay. Let's go back. It is to a person's idiosyncrasies that we must look when inquiring into a case such as this. Why Miss Sturton and not some other governess? And in particular, does anything link her with someone acquainted with Mary Dunsbury? All right, so we, we, we missed this little thread of the case, but we didn't need it, but we didn't miss it. Her habits, says Wiggins thoughtfully, she often took long walks in the park. In Hyde Park, evidently, Holmes responds, it being the only park in the vicinity in which one could take a long walk. And she would do this in all weathers and away from the established paths. Strange, is it not, that a woman who walks alone in isolated places is kidnapped on a city street? That point alone is most enlightening. In Hyde Park, the first port of call was the police station as Miss Sturton knew the policeman who worked in the parks. Constable Terrell said that Miss Sturton would normally walk near the gunpowder magazine. He also revealed that Constable Ponsford was on duty the morning of the kidnapping and that Ponsford refused to exchange shifts that day. At the gunpowder magazine, there were recent tracks from a large wagon and many tracks from a small cart coming from the west. There was also a burnt cigar which raised the fascinating questions why would you partly smoke an expensive cigar? 
if you were disturbed and had to run? Suggests Wiggins. Yes, agrees Holmes, that is possible. But there is another reason which begins to shed light on this whole affair. A reason to partly smoke a cigar, or indeed to partly drink a drink, or eat a food, is to taste it. If you are buying hundreds of expensive, illegally imported cigars, you want to know what you're getting, you want to know you are getting what you paid for. Of course, Watson stares at Holmes. Cigars stored in a gunpowder magazine, which was built to be secure, dry, and cool. There was a hint about it being dry and cool, and we, uh, that went right by us. But perfect for tobacco, he says. That's, that's nice. Holmes nods and proceeds to the heart of the narrative. Following the cart tracks to the west led to the plant nursery, where a delivery list bore the name Grace Allende. Thursday's Times mentions a Grace Allende, who is an acquaintance and possibly friend of Mary Dunsworthy. So they're on the section on Mary. Grace was friends with Mary. So we did not, we didn't make that connection in the newspaper. There's a lot in the newspaper. Okay, so that's nice. We missed that little thread. Uh, suddenly, we have the connection we sought between the two kidnappings. Constable Terrell said that Sir Colin Pickwick's daughter Grace was involved in managing, managing the park affairs. Before visiting Sir Colin, however, a trip to Amber and Company confirmed the cigar found in Hyde Park was an expensive type containing West Indian tobacco subject to high import tax. At the home of Sir Colin Pickwick, reference was made to Grace being the widow of Eduardo Allende, who owned many plantations in the West Indies and exported tobacco and sugar around the world. Now we can begin to piece the puzzle together. When Grace returned after her husband's death and found her brother in charge of Hyde Park, she arranged for her contacts in the West Indies to send them some cigars with the plants for the park, avoiding the heavy import tax on tobacco. You will have observed on the delivery list in the nursery that Grace receives all deliveries from the West Indies. At first, they probably intended to acquire a few boxes for themselves, then perhaps their contacts began offering more, or they realized customs were paying little attention to the deliveries. Either way, they ended up receiving many boxes and needed a place to store them. They must have thought there was no problem in having a large stock of good cigars to hand. That was until last month, when their father ordered a review of all the buildings in Hyde Park. And suddenly, they have to get rid of all of their illegal cigars, says Wiggins, and quickly, before the magazine is inspected. Patrick goes to the Raven and Rat to find a buyer and is given the name Moriarty. He finds a way to contact Moriarty and tells him what they are offering. And here we come to Constable Ponsford, says Holmes, who had been making his way through the cigars he had been given. There was an open box of them in his house. Yes, we noticed that as well. Patrick and Grace must have suggested to Ponsford that if he took some cigars off their hands, then on one of his morning shifts, he would not look in the direction of the gunpowder magazine. When Ponsford learned that Miss Stratton walked in the park most mornings, he realized the siblings may be involved in the kidnapping of Miss Stratton. So remember when we confronted him, he looked a little surprised, but we couldn't tell if it was because we caught him, but actually maybe he was. Maybe then it did click to him. When Ponsford learned that Miss Stratton walked in the park most mornings, he realized the siblings may be involved in the kidnapping of Miss Stratton and was struck with guilt. Illegally imported cigars are one thing, but kidnapping is quite another. So I'm going to dock us some of the points we got for, um, I'm going to dock us half the points we got for saying, we said that the cop was involved in it and probably gave them the information about the kidnapping. Um, but that's not true. He was bribed. So he's tie he was tied in a little bit, but he wasn't the connection to the details of the kidnapping and he didn't know about the kidnapping. In fact, he was just bribed to look the other way. Okay, so Mrs. Sturton was taken to stop her seeing the deal take place. This is the last paragraph. Exactly, Watson. She walked in the park most mornings and was friends with Constable Tribble. Patrick and Grace could not risk her seeing something, but the deal had to take place early in the morning when there would be little light and few people. It also had to happen when Ponsford was on duty before the inspection of the magazine. 
Having so far only been guilty of import tax evasion, I doubt they felt ready to add murder to their crimes. A kidnapping of Mary Dunsworthy gave them an alternative. They followed Miss Sturton home from the park, waited for her to leave the house again. They could not kidnap her during her walk, as that would make the park the focus of the police investigation. We didn't say that out loud, but that was, that was pretty clear to me that that's why they didn't want to kidnap her there. Um, because that would make the park the focus of the investigation and the deal would become impossible. Where was she held? asked Watson. Oh, there's more. In Hyde Park, Holmes answers. I imagine at the lodge, that's what we think too, the mud on her shoes was consistent with a park and she did not wear those shoes for her walks as she had boots for the purpose, for that purpose. Patrick and Grace drove her around the city streets and then into the park to create the effect of leaving London. That's what, that's what we guessed. Excuse me. As Mary had described in her the case of her capture. So we, we missed a lot by not talking to Mary about her kidnapping. And now I realize where you've been, Mr. Holmes, said Wiggins. You were trying to track down this Professor Moriarty. Holmes slumps into his armchair with a dejected air. Indeed, Wiggins. I learned a week ago that a deal was due to take place and Moriarty was involved. My interest was piqued. Not because this was some grand crime, but because it was precisely the opposite. You see, it is through their less grandiose crimes that the most devious of criminals are often caught. At such times, they are more careless than when engaged in their most heinous endeavors. Alas, I got close, but the trail, but lost the trail in a warehouse in the East End. The capture of James Moriarty must wait until another day. He reaches into his jacket pocket and draws out a cigar of a type with which we are now familiar. This was all I gained from my troubles, but somehow I cannot bring myself to smoke it. Watson, perhaps you will do the honors. He passes the cigar to Watson and reaches for his violin. For myself, I feel Paganini is calling. There are introductions to, to some of Holmes' informants in this case. If you do not visit them, go do them. Holmes would have solved this case in nine leads. So it tells us the leads he would have found. He went to the train ho household, then he went to Rosanna Dunsworthy. So why did we not find Dunsworthy? Because we looked her up and couldn't find her, I believe. Did I do that wrong? Dunsworthy. Forty three Southwest. Did we go to forty three Southwest? We did go to forty three. <gasps> Look, we put a blue on it, and we never went to it. I think that's what happened. I don't think we ever went to it. I think we overlooked it because of the color of the cube. Yep. We never went to it. One of our early clues, we never went to it because, I don't know, it was marked this and we never went to it. That's a huge lesson in the future. Careless police work. Wow, we got lucky that we got so far. Um, okay, but we came to it with other means. Um, then he went to Hyde Park. Then he went to the tobacconist, then he went to talk to the police detective. Um, Bradley's and Simpson's cigar free leads do not encounter them. Okay, anyway. So, but if we calculate that about right, our score goes from, let's see, if we believe 26 leads, I'm going to, and I'm docking us a little bit. So we actually lost 12 points. So instead of 160, we got 148 points, let's say. We took 20, 26 leads, and he did it in nine. So we did six, sorry, we did 18, 26 leads. He did it in nine, so 17. We did 17 more than he did. I think it said five points penalty, so that would be 85 point penalty, 85 point penalty, right? 50 plus 35, 85 from 148, 85, 3, 1, 6, 60, 63 points 
So we got everything right, but we took so long that we got we got hurt a bit. And I don't know, do the rules do the rules specify like what score is good or bad? Let's just look at it to give you some idea if you wanted to score it, if you wanted to see how well you score. Okay, what did we say? 63. So from 35 to 65, you solve most of the case. Holmes thinks you're clearly ready to take on more. 70 to 95, congratulations. Only Sherlock Holmes could find faults. We're just, we're actually just like a tiny bit away from it. Okay. So that was case one, the Curzon Street kidnapping from Sherlock Holmes, Baker Street Irregulars. Here's the board in all its glory and all the places we went. Right, all our regulars, we got most of our stuff. It's interesting that the, uh, the last thing I was so concerned about, uh, that guy and where he went off to and number and A, that those didn't come up. Maybe A came up and I just don't remember it. I guess we're talking talking about the case. We're gonna re review it. But um, so first of all, I am so glad we got a chance to play this. Six hours and thirty three minutes. Wow, okay. I'm so glad we got a chance to play this because it's been a while since I played Sherlock Holmes. And if you watch uh, our top 10 co-op uh, co-ops of all time, I rated Sherlock Holmes very highly. I won't tell you where I put it, but I have such fond memory of playing this game and it being so thematic and atmospheric and just loving it, loving it like reading a book, transporting back in that time. But since then we've played a, lots of other detective games that are much more modern. And I've sort of forgotten and come to question uh, how much I liked it. And then Greg and I played these three Jack the Ripper Sherlock Holmes cases that were very, very frustrating. And you can hear us talk about that because they're, they don't really have solutions. So I was starting to question how good the Sherlock Holmes system was and whether after playing all these modern games, Chronicles of Crime, whatever, whether Sherlock Holmes was going to be a huge disappointment and not hold up. And the answer is, it holds up. It holds up for all the reasons that we remembered, which is like leaving aside all the fun of unraveling this mystery slowly. I mean, the, the love and care and the quality of the writing, I hope, I mean, I hope you guys feel the same way I do. I don't know if it comes across listening to me do these terrible voices, but like, I feel we're, like we're back in there. Like we're meeting these characters. Remember the woman who's like the old, the, the old maid, she's like, you know, I left on good terms. They're good God fearing family. I just got married. She shows us her ring. We met the old um, medical examiner. Like we met characters, right? And even our little group, we've got Watson, we're with Wiggins and we're, we're, you know, we're doing our own little interaction. We're, we're using Sherlock Holmes' name to influence people a couple times. We're meeting these underworld characters. They're involved in this sort of shady stuff, but they're, it's all in this 1800, we learned about gunpowder magazines. So like, yeah, uh, the writing works. Like uh, David Neal, yeah, David Neal did an amazing job of writing stories set in 1800s. Like, yeah, it worked. It, it gave me that feeling of traveling back in time and going to these places. And we had some very cool moments in the game where we had to find the chemist nearby and it was, it was actually quite nice that there were these two tracks of mysteries happening at the same time, right? Like the the family and the kid and the opium and then these illegal imports and they're so, they were not very related and so when you were we were sort of tracking them tracing tracing them both at the same time and uh, huge use of the newspaper more than most of the cases I remember playing of Sherlock Holmes which was great newspaper was great very thematic and very cool how there were all these different things 
Lots of red herrings, as you expect, as all of these mystery games have. The suicide death in the park, I guess, was complete red herring. But nice didn't, like, you know, that would have been what we guessed. We couldn't tie it in, but it was nice. It led us to the park. It wasn't so easy that, like, we got, we missed a part, right? Now, this was a cool part. When we read the solution, I've talked about this before with Sherlock Holmes. There occasionally I'll play a mist. Uh, we've I've played one of these Sherlock Holmes, and I'll come up with a hypothesis of something, and then the true answer is slightly different, and I'll like mine better, right? Like sometimes it's a motive thing. Like this is the motive why this person killed this person, and I feel like my motive was better. So when we read the solution to this case it got to the question of what was the constable's involvement. And the, the, the answer was that he was bribed. He was bribed. And when we tried to solve it, before we tried to solve it, um, my conclusion was that he was in on it. More, he was more involved. And that probably, like we concluded that the kidnappings, because of the, handwriting and all the details that the case talks about, like it was too much money, they released her too soon, all the reasons why we knew this was not the same as the real kidnapping of Mary Dunsworthy. But in the course of our investigation, we found out that the details of the kidnapping were not revealed to the press and that this kidnapping matched some of those details, at least on the surface level of that kidnapping. Um, just the wording of the note. And so it was a mystery how this could be a fake kidnapping, not related to the Dunworthy criminals, the gang that did that. But how did they find the information? And the conclusion that I reached to, uh, that I leaped to, which seems reasonable, is that the cop since we know we found that the newspaper didn't have the information, then probably it came from the cop, which is a completely reasonable um, deductive step. But uh, when we now see that we missed a clue, we missed talking to the people, the previous kidnapping that the newspaper tells us about. Now, we put a cube on here, but we didn't put our normal pink cube that tells us we should go investigate that. We sort of put a blue cube because we thought, well, maybe it's not, maybe she's not involved in the kidnapping. But in doing that, we got sloppy. And we never went and visited her. Now, if we had visited her, she would have told us that, she would have told us the details of the case, presumably, and that she had been telling her friends a little bit. Now, I'm not even sure that would have been enough. Um, but the Holmes reminds us that in the paper, when we read about this Dunworthy family at the art gallery, we hear that Grace Allende was also observed in the company with her brother Patrick and the Lewin twins, Miss Mary Dunworthy, accompanied by her good friend, the artist, Emil Manton was an, was an elegant and agreeable host. So if we had tracked this down more, we may, and we had gone back and reread the newspaper, we may have connected these two, the brother and sister, which we knew were involved in the case. We knew they were the kidnappers, but we didn't make the connection to Mary. And if we had, we may have figured out that, okay, they probably got the details of the kidnapping by being friends with Mary. So it's actually nice that we were penalized for missing that coup. And that that's almost a good thing. It's a, you want to be you want to be rewarded by the time we've talked about this. I've talked about this for these detective games. That part of the mechanic of these detective games is sort of challenging your stamina in real life in playing these games and your attention to detail and your ability to keep notes and stuff. So in addition to sort of the mechanics of the puzzle of the game, there's this interesting secondary challenge in your, 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 your bookkeeping and your attention to detail 
I love that the initial mystery didn't tell us vocation numbers. Like if you remember Ellery Queen and some of the Sherlock Holmes tell you this one's just like, you can find this, you can find these places, you can figure out where the trains lived. Even start, the case started fantastically where we had to decide where to go. Pacing was great. You probably could have solved this. You know, you could have cut a couple hours out of this playthrough if you wanted to. Obviously, you could cut many hours out of this playthrough if you didn't have to read things aloud. But, boy, that was enjoyable. It was an enjoyable mystery to have unfold. And at least the way I play these games, I'm okay if after hour five, you've sort of got everything tied into a nice bow. And the fact that we missed that is, is great. So, yeah, I would give this a 10. That's my, my rating for this one case. Obviously, there are nine more in this box. I don't know if they're all going to be as good. I love the idea that some of these are continuing. I love how much you use the newspaper. So Dave Neal, absolutely outstanding job. Made me remember what I love most about Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. This is as good, um, as enjoyable an experience as I hoped. And I thought, so yeah, 10. 10 for case one. I mean, we'd have to play more to see if they all convey this same story. But exactly what I wanted in Sherlock Holmes, a return to the mastery of the game. Um, now, what was I going to say? I was going to say something about... I love that some of these cases continue. And the newspapers, even more, even more use of the newspapers. Oh, I remember the other thing I wanted to say. So... I was worried about this box. I'll tell you why. Not not because it's the modern, it's the most modern box. And I don't remember, like some of the other boxes that were released recently were actually compilations of some older cases. But I was really worried about this box because in all of the other boxes, in all of the other cases, you play Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes and Watson solving these cases. And this game was the Irregulars, you're with these kids. And I was worried that that was going to, um, sometimes you play Watson, maybe most of the time you don't play Sherlock Holmes, you play Watson. Anyway, point is, I was worried that running around with these little kids was gonna be annoying. But it was actually pretty cool. We didn't, like it didn't, they didn't really treat us as kids and we had interactions with them where we were, we were with Watson, and so it was kind of fun to have these little different personalities. Although, you might think that some of these people would be reluctant to talk to these little kids, but maybe we're not that little. Maybe we're like 17 years old. I guess we look pretty haggard. We're on the streets. We look pretty rough. So yeah, I hope you guys liked it. And we're going to continue playing these detective games. I'm tempted to play more episodes in this uh in this box, but highly recommended. And thanks for joining. If you like, uh, if you, if you, it's almost seven hours. This might be our longest single video. If you like the video, please consider actually liking it with the button and subscribing and watching uh, our future live streams. I've been doing one, one a week each weekend. I'll probably continue that for a while. We'll do some more detective games. Eventually we're going to do Mythos Tales and Gumshoe. If you really like this content, consider becoming a Patreon supporter. And um, hopefully I can convince Greg to play one of these with me. And we'll see you guys next time.